can impose its will on the taxing powers of uh, our town. In other words, by you, by uh, if if uh, we uh, it's decided that we we go the combined uh, boat route, which is not mentioned anywhere. So. Uh, are we back again uh, more than 200 years uh, pretty much almost uh, taxation without representation i mean what this this is a very very peculiar situation and uh, i was uh, interested to hear this this person uh, make that comment uh, that it uh, he couldn't understand how that could really withstand a legal uh, 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 kind of uh, 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 oh, oversight or no, not oversight, but uh, I can't even think straight. I, I'm, I'm so <laughs> upset about it. Uh, also, this and that's that's the more important uh, part. Uh, then, uh, when I was speaking with um, Phil Gaudet last week, uh, and uh, I said to him, "Okay, so you will certify the Yarmouth votes, and your counterpart in Dennis will certify." Dennis votes. So who or what entity will be certifying the so-called combined vote? <coughs> and he had no idea. And this this is a, more of a little technicality, but it still m I mean, I m might have some bearing on it. I think the other what was raised by uh, the uh, the elected official is I think much more important. I believe the uh, uh, Section 16N says the uh, uh, the vote will be certified to the district committee. Uh, uh, so that's 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 who the vote is certified to. Uh, what they do with it at that point, uh, I think, is up to le legal interpretation, and that's part of part of the reason we have our legal counsel here this evening. Okay. So thank, thank you. you. Is there anyone else from the public that uh, would like to address Tom? <coughs> Tom Sullivan, West Yarmouth. I uh, know I'm just to follow up what you just said. Uh, it does say that, that the town clerk shall certify the results of the election to the district committee, except as provided here in the election shall be conducted in each town, in other words, separately, in the same manner as town meetings for the election of town offices. So it's a separate vote by each town. My question is, in the town attorney, what law gives the school committee to combine the vote? It's not in Section D at all, on this thing at all. It doesn't say the word combined vote. It does say member town votes, single town. So the, uh, it's a word game. Yeah. It is obvious yeah. a word game. Yeah. But where does the school committee have the authority after the town of Yarmouth certifies the vote, Dennis certifies the vote, that they take it and then combine it together? That's the key, I think, and I have not been able to find any law in within Chapter 71 that does that. There is a reference to Chapter D in Section 14D, right. but that refers back to Section D and N. So I don't see where the school committee can do it. I think we'll explore that question tonight. Uh, All right. I think. Thank, thank you. Okay. okay. Anyone else? Okay. Seeing none, we'll uh, proceed on with our discussion with regard to the uh, school school building project and the agreement. I uh, invite Jay uh, Talman to um, come forth, and we'll grill him with questions. <laughs> How are you tonight? I'm good. How about you? <laughs> good. Happy New Year, everybody. Yes, thank you. I think first, uh, th there have been so many questions uh, generated from not only from uh, the board, but after rereading and uh, re uh, uh, the sections of Chapter 71 that apply to the um, uh, this recent vote, and um, and rereading our agreement in itself. Uh, that uh, you know, I, I really think your counsel on this is is very important to us. So. Um, you know, I guess uh, I'd kind of li like to let you talk about that uh, for a minute, but I, I, I guess one of the central questions that I certainly have, and kind of open it up to board questions, is that it, it appears that our agreement um, specifically says that uh, a vote will occur with regard to or using uh, Section D. Correct. And um, 
you know, the uh, uh, Chapter 71, uh, it, the interpretation uh, of other sections having to do with that, uh, it's very difficult. So uh, could you comment on, on uh, why the school committee could override our agreement? Because the statute allows, provides an override provision that has in, it has enhanced requirements to do the override, but it, it provides it. So as we m noted in our opinion of August 3rd, um, and as is uh, noted in slightly different format in school committee's council's opinion of June 15th, there are really three ways to get there on these, on these votes. You, the, the statute states that um, you can use Clause N. You can put that in your regional agreement if right. you want to. That's the big tent vote. You're allowed to do that. If you don't do that, if you choose not to put that in your agreement, then you're under Clause D, period. Mm -hmm. So if you're silent on N, you're in D by default. Yep. D is the, the right for each town to disapprove. No required vote for the b ballot box unless you're attaching it to a companion override. So if so, if you had if your agreement was totally silent on on either either it's D, then it would go with D. But regardless of what your agreement says, the next sentence is determinative. It says, notwithstanding the provisions of this section, meaning forget about everything you just read. That's uh, another way of saying it. If the school committee, by two thirds of the members, a supermajority, decides to that it wants to go with N, N rules. That's what it says. <coughs> the term "notwithstanding," I could probably ask Mike could probably back me up on this. If we ask ten lawyers what the word "notwithstanding" means, it's hard to to pin it down. But it essentially means that, regardless of what you read <coughs> in the prior two sentences of this section under sex chapter 71 section 14d if two-thirds of the members of your school committee choose n that's where you are i guess the trouble that i have with that at this point is that <clears throat> our agreement did not omit uh mention of of debt it said we will uh adopt uh debt only under article 16d Right. It was very specific. So to me, what that says is um, it says in any district for which the agreement does not so provide. It not so I, provide. Me, the so provide means N. If you read the, the language of 7114D, it says that the, the – a regional agreement may provide that the incurring of indebtedness by the district shall be approved by the registered voters in the member towns pursuant to the provisions of clause N of the of section 16 in any district for which the agreement does not so provide it doesn't say where the agreement is silent on on any method it says in any agreement where it doesn't provide for N then you've got D by default mm -hmm. okay great so that would be commit us to d if it weren't for the very next sentence which is says notwithstanding the provisions of this section notwithstanding anything before if two-thirds a supermajority of the school committee get together and decide to use n that's where you are well i guess i i, I still have trouble with that in regard to um our agreement was very specific and said we want D uh, and and so to me what uh, what that says is that it's not a it's not a question of our agreement not providing it our agreement did provide it. it's very specific it says section 14 D and uh, uh, I'm sorry 16 uh, mm -hmm. yep. uh, I had the agreement here but um, it, it's very specific with regard to that and I think the intent of the towns was to put everything through town meeting um, and and I think that that in itself uh, the the needs of the towns to authorize the debt it's, it says the incurring of indebtedness 
uh, except temporary indebtedness and anticipation of revenue by the district shall be subject to the disapproval by the registered voters in the member towns pursuant to the provisions of Clause D of Section 16 of Chapter 71 of the General Laws uh, as it may from time to time be amended. You know, I can understand in a district with many towns the difficulty of going through a disapproval process uh, under under 16D, where any one town of six might be able to uh, negate the whole vote. But in a two-town district where the agreement specifically says they have to go through town meeting, it just seems to me that that's a very convincing argument that that's what the towns intended and and uh, to otherwise say well we're gonna we're gonna throw it in the hands of of the school committee to just negate any portion of the agreement they wish to do so I mean, it just doesn't make any sense to me in, in a uh, uh, and, and b believe me norm I am not in any way advocating for how this went down in any way shape or form but in uh, just kind of reviewing this from the way attorneys review potential inconsistencies and I understand and appreciate the the level of detail of your analysis I've got a general law though that would is a higher form of law that says notwithstanding any school committee by a two-thirds vote so there's the fail-safe in there I think they understood when they drafted this even though I don't think personally that they ever intended this to apply to two town districts and in fact it's very rare to happen you can understand the rationale for it for multi-town districts a la the Cape Tech vote and why it makes sense but in a two-town district it seems like an overly blunt instrument in my view and I think people in this room agree with that I think but the fact that the fail safe here says what they can do that particularly in a, in a in a district where in fact the town with the, the most significant financial interest is the one that's being forced against the wall, even though uh, it's very apparent that the town's wishes by, by a vote uh, are not to fund uh, this, uh, uh, this debt. You know, it just, um, I, I can't imagine a court uh, uh, saying, well, gee, yeah, you're out of luck because, you know, uh, it, you can let a, a one-third participant in uh, an agreement of this sort dictate to the major, major player. Well, you know, I, I can anticipate the response to that. So, again, I'm, I'm not advocating for them, but the response to that would be that we are not, that that's not what they did. They opened it up and everyone had a fair shot at it. If you control that many more people and the people of your town were against it, then so be it. You had every chance and opportunity to to beat back the, the forces of Dennis in this. So I, I think there's a rationale as opposed to that. I, I think the better argument that you have here is that we fit in between the lang the, those two sentences that I read in 14D that were – we are silent as to 16N, but we're not silent as to 16D, and it's a shall. I view, in a way, a regional agreement as a sort of special act of the legislature. It's kind of a, a special form of legislation. What we know from that, and it doesn't even really rise to that level because that's not the form that it took. It is a regional agreement adopted pursuant to statute, but it takes on the form of kind of a, a, a body of law. So to, so to speak. Let's just call it that. I don't think mm -hmm. it gets quite that right. way. But let's just say it was adopted like a charter provision, which we would adopt pursuant to a special act of the legislature. What we know from looking at the conflicts <coughs> between charter and general law is that general law always prevails where there's a conflict. But more than that, the laws of statutory construction are that you can't read one at the exclusion of another. If at all possible, you're supposed to harmonize. And I think the rationale here that, that we would have would completely nullify the, the, that last sentence in 14D. The, 
essentially taking that power away from a school committee. I understand the argument, and I'm certainly, if, if directed to do so, would file litigation to challenge it. I just think that overwhelmingly the legislature intended through the general laws that through a supermajority requirement of the school committee members, which again, Yarmouth must have included Yarmouth representatives, they could proceed with something that was extraordinary in nature. And that's what they did. It so happens, even though it's not binding on us, that the um, Department of Elementary and Secondary Education agreed with that. Now, I don't think that their opinion is worth anything in a court of law, but you can best believe that a court will defer to an agency, an agency's interpretation in large part over statutes which govern their member towns. Again, not determinative. The court is free to reach a, a, a different conclusion. I, I think it's very unlikely that they would. And again, I understand and appreciate the argument and all the hard work and brain power that goes into it. But when I look at all these things in the totality and the fail safe that that statute provides, it's really difficult for me as an attorney to counsel that this is would be a good you know, an, an easy challenge uh, or a successful one. And, and we would also, in addition to that, have to go get an injunction to stop what's going on right now, which would, we would have to show a likelihood of success on the merits. Mm -hmm. Very difficult. Um, what about the question of, you know, is it a combined vote? It's, I think that one's easier to easier to answer. I, I think they talk about one election. They talk about the majority of the voters in the district. I, I think that that's that's pretty clear. I, I think you, the argument that you raised previously is a is a more compelling argument because it does it does identify a gap. And even the school council recognizes that when they say in their opinion that the party's regional agreement mentioned 16D. Mm -hmm. So they recognize that there's an unaccounted uh, for possibility in the statute. The statute is silent with respect to that. It would be a lot, this would be a lot better argument that says that you, if it said under 14D, an, an agreement's determination uh, as to whether they want to go by 16D or 16N shall be determinative and then to have the notwithstanding language. They forgot one other possibility that the agreement could be by 16D, but perhaps they did that because 16D is always the fallback anyway. Mm -hmm. So regardless of whether you're in the world of 16D on purpose or by default, you can supersede that so long as you get the supermajority of the school committee members. Yeah. I think that's overwhelmingly likely to be the result. I mean, we're, I'm happy to discuss. We could discuss in the context of uh, a more private discussion if that's where the, the board wanted to go. Uh, but the, the statute and the way I've read it and my partners and our associates who do some school work have talked it over and chewed on it. Dan and I have had several conversations about it. It is not for lack of trying that we've tried to formulate a sound legal opinion as to a different result, but it's just really difficult to get there. I have one other question on process before I open it up to the rest of the board, and that is with regard to um, the wording on 16N. Um, 16N says you've got to go through two steps, basically. You have to have an authorization for borrowing <laughs> And then the school committee yep. has to say uh, that we're requiring this to go to a vote. Sure. I don't see where that was done. I, I, I have the record of the October 18th meeting of the school committee where they authorized the borrowing, the debt, uh, of $116 million. I don't see anything where the school committee then acted to require I'd have to look at the the text in the minutes of, of their of their vote uh, norm I'm, I'm happy to take a look at that yeah, that's right here I don't think they have to do much except to advance it in the 16d context the way they, they notify us it's it's pretty straightforward 
Um, well. Uh, it's pretty, I mean, the language is right in the middle of this. Well, they talk about authorization. And I understand the authorization part. The debt, debt was certainly authorized by them. Uh, and there's two references to that in that, in that vote. But I don't, the, the, um, uh, if you go back to 14D, it says, by vote of two-thirds of all its members require that the approval of any particular authorized issue of indebtedness shall be by the registered voters of the member towns. So, you know, I guess I was looking for a very specific vote by the school committee requiring the approval uh, of the authorized issue of indebtedness by the registered voters. Well, cer certainly the, the vote itself, they can't put the cart before the horse. I, I view the, the language of 16D where, where that you just cited to be essentially a paraphrase of the requirements that are more specifically under 16N. Under 16N, it says provided that the vote of the district committee authorizing such debt, I, I'd be hard pressed to read this vote in a manner that doesn't result in a conclusion that they did authorize it. There is another question out there that is in terms of certification or of the authorization by the local, the local authorization, and that is the certification of the vote, which is obviously still kind of somewhat forthcoming because of the recount that, mm -hmm. that's in, in front of us. But um, So you don't see a specific requirement that they have vote to require the towns or require the uh, 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 the, uh, use a specific language under 14D, um, require the approval of, uh, of any, uh, of, of this indebtedness by, uh, by the registered voters. I, I think it's inherent in this vote. It's to meet this appropriation, the district is authorized to borrow said amount under and pursuant to chapter 71, section 16N. It's, I mean, that's capturing it. Okay. Yeah, I, I think that that one, that one wouldn't I impress a superior court judge. Um, again, I think you, you might get a superior court judge to think about the, the lack of language regarding 16D and the fact that we have in our regional agreement. It certainly sets up an interesting scholarly um, argument, uh, not one that I think think is great, but certainly better than those other two arguments. Okay. All right. I'm going to open it up to the rest of the board at this point. Uh, no, and, and look, I, I, I hate to be the, the person who says I, I, I disagree with the, the basis of, of any argument because I, I think that everyone put a lot of heart and soul in this and has really strong feelings about it. And b believe me, between myself and, and, your, and your staff, we've turned over every stone to uh, make sure that whatever happens is done appropriately. We, we, okay. we really ha have worked hard on it. And we'll continue and we'll even take a flyer on something if that's the direction of, of the board. And w we could make a straight face, certainly a straight face reasonable argument in that regard. I'm, mm -hmm. I, I have my doubts on where that'll get us, but we could also have that discussion in executive session should the board um, okay. express an interest in that. Thanks, Jay, and appreciate you being here. Where I get stuck is that, you know, 16D is the default if nothing else is specifically mentioned. But you seem to want to take the, the, the language of 16D being the default if, if the regional agreement is silent and notwithstanding that two-thirds vote, I, I think that it, it's referring to the two-thirds vote being applicable if the regional agreement is silent. You t I think you take them separately, whereas I take them together, you know, one, not being exclusive of one another. So we kind of have 
you know, in, in freshman high school programming, we had if-then clauses <laughs> and then go-tos. Um, Thanks for bringing me back. To <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, so, you know, I guess I don't really know in this instance what non, non, notwithstanding means. And can we look at it as saying that, okay, 16D refers to 16D being the default if the regional agreement is silent, and if the regional agreement is silent, then the school committee has the right by two-thirds vote to go to N, or is it one or the other? Because I don't see how, you know, we, we, we enact these regional agreements. Both towns voted on it whenever they did. It doesn't seem, seem to me that seven people would have the right to override what both towns in their entirety voted to adopt which is effectively I, I, what the school committee has done by using your interpretation of that two-thirds clause. Uh, and, and I, that is the nub, right? That is the, that is the, the toehold, so to speak, that, that we would be relying on. Uh, on the first issue, which that you mentioned, the, the agreement is not silent, the, the language doesn't require that the agreement be silent, and any district for which the agreement does not so provide relates back to 16N. So I think, I, I think what I'm assuming as the, for the sake of argument is that 16D in, in all circumstances is the fallback unless your agreement says 16N, and then s suggests that regardless, if, if a two-thirds majority of a school committee wants to stick their neck out and Everyone does this without, it's not like this statute sprung up on anyone, it's been there. If they want to stick their neck out and go with 16N, that, uh, that appears to be kind of a superpower that they have in all circumstances. It's not in the, in the agreement, it's in the statute. It's hard for me to read, to harmonize the provisions of, the, of all of the statutes in the agreement to remove that special power that they have out. I, I get it, and, and I think it's as good an argument as we'd get if we were going to go for a challenge here. That's really all I, I have left. I've kind of, <laughs> I've yeah. talked, I've had half a dozen arguments inside my head and I've talked myself out of every it, one it, of them. It's That's the one that has the, the certainly the, the most ab appeal from a, a lawyer's perspective from being able to, to get in there. I don't, I don't see anything in the legislative history that resonates with it, but I do see a lot in the statutes that essentially were 16D, it's 16D, it's 16D, but you also have this kind of extraordinary opportunity over here, and I think that that's likely where the interpretation comes down. Um, but again, I think it's an interesting argument. Um, I it, it just think it would it'd be hard for a court to overlook that notwithstanding language. Okay, thank you. Tracy? <laughs> well, I agree with Eric. I don't, I don't think that the townspeople put that provision in there for any other reason other than that's the way they wanted it to be followed. Mm. I don't see any other reason to, to assume that. None. I don't think any court would see any reason to assume that. Mm. I really don't. I think that when you read it, it gets complicated. However, it does talk about two-thirds of the majority and the multi-towns. I don't think the provision was at all um, crafted for a two-town district. No, nor do I, but it also doesn't specifically exclude it, unfortunately. Because in the case where we've seen it used before, um, it was specific in, their, in the regional agreement, and in in the regional agreement was allowed for that provision. Um, have we done any research to see two towns um, that have utilized this provision uh, and the process of which that happened in terms of whether or not it was exclusive to their regional agreement or if it was not within the regional agreement? I have not done exhaustive research. We did look at a couple of uh, various and assorted, but it, I can't think of a situation that has reached this level of, of conflict. I mean, we, we could do a survey of each and every regional agreement. And I think what well, it would what be- What I'm curious is if there's there's been debt that uh, a two-town 
district has opted for N when it's been silent or if, if they've all went through town meeting, if they've, if they've been able to utilize We weren't provision. able to find a single instance of, of, of that, which isn't to say that one may not have happened, but I, I was, we, we did do as much of a search, just the same kind of search that all of us would do, because it's not too. like that's Guess a public what? record. We either. couldn't find anyone. I, I think it actually, based upon some <laughs> correspondence and some emails that I saw, uh, caught MSBA a little by su surprise too, because I don't think, it was an animal that they had seen either well, in I mean, that context. I mean, we're I guess the other consideration, I, I, to follow uh, Tracy's thinking, the, the uh, you know, our towns had the unfortunate history of going through a tent meeting uh, for a rejected budget. So yeah, we had to go to process, a, yeah. uh, a meeting. That's specifically provided for in our agreement mm -hmm. with regard to the budget. Debt is even, I mean, this, the, the um, commitment to $117 million worth of debt compared to an annual budget is huge. And, and that would seem to me to be even more of a reason that an individual town in a two-member district could uh, reject that kind of commitment. Or should be able to. Or should be able to, right. Uh, I, I'm sorry, Tracy. No, I, interrupted I mean, the, yeah. there's a lot of pieces. I've, I've read it. I can't tell you how many times I've read the regional oh, agreement. Oh. <laughs> um, you know, and I do so, I think, on behalf of our residents who feel like they didn't have a voice. Right. I, I understand what you're saying about the majority. Um, I just, I guess I feel that um, when you think about the specific indebtedness question, the two thirds, the majority towns, there's a reason why we haven't seen other two town districts utilize that provision. Because it was in our regional agreement. And I don't, I don't, for, I don't see any board that should supersede town meeting, but. Um, <laughs> um, thanks, Jay, for all the analysis that you've provided tonight. Um, I, I think on the one side, and, and I think Tracy has gotten to it, and, and Eric is in Norm as well, uh, are, the, are the equities of the situation we find ourselves in and how problematic that is when um, the town that really has the majority of the debt that results from the election um, has a negative vote, both in terms of proceeding with the um, project and also funding it, and that finds itself thinking that the tyranny of the minority is prevailing here. Um, however, as you pointed out under Section 14D, that last notwithstanding provision, is something that's extremely difficult, if not insurmountable, to, to deal with um, when you're looking at at this um, the legal the legal argument here. The legislature apparently, um, well, first of all, what what does that mean? I agree. Notwithstanding means, despite anything else that's provided. This is is what follows. I mean, it's a it's a it's a it's, it's a heads up to the trumping provision that follows. Uh, when you say notwithstanding anything that I've said, this is the case. It, it's another way of saying right. you don't even look at that other stuff when you're looking at what follows that provision. That, that's what it means. And um, so they, they go through in, in um, 7114D, Chapter 7114D, they talk about um, Clause N and Clause D and how D is the default section, but that school districts can provide for Clause N. Then it says, notwithstanding pr the provisions of this section, it says, Dis despite that, 
the, the district committee made by two-thirds of its members and then it goes on to say that they can opt to use section um, 16 rather than um, section D so really what, what I think we have here in terms of uh, what we would have to deal with in, in terms of litigation is not the equities of what happened so much as the statutory construction absolutely that's really the issue what what does this when you take these um, sections um, section 16 clause D section 16 clause N and then section 14 capital D when you look at those all together what does it mean that's really what you're going to have before a court and the way courts proceed in interpreting statutes isn't just randomly looking at the results that, that, that the aggrieved party says that uh, they're stuck with. They look at, they, they try to make a harmonious whole out of the various sections. They try to read the statute in some rational manner, reconciling the various provisions. That's really how they're going to look at it. And um, I think that's the problem here, is that, <laughs> that notwithstanding language, it's, it's really a tough nut to crack. Um, but I want to skip from that for a minute. Tom Sullivan has raised the issue that even if you have a vote under Section 16N, um, what says, where does it say that you look at the combined vote rather than the vote in each town? Now, <clears throat> I could make some arguments why I think um, in a regional election you would consider the totality of the votes. But in terms of the statute, I don't see any specific language How, that I, says you do that. Um, so, I mean, if we looked at it just kind of from a logic puzzle uh, a little bit, how else could it could it be interpreted? What would the votes of the individual town be? It, it would it say then if it passes in both towns, then you're good to go. Mm -hmm. it doesn't say that. There's so many provisions under 16 and others that talk about you need so many of the towns to come doesn't along. Doesn't it say the majority of two thirds of the members? No. No. It, yeah, For example, if, if you were to proceed under 16D at a town meeting, you would have to, you would have to prevail in each town. Uh, no. You just, the towns have a right, have a veto power. Well, that's what I mean. It, that, that's well, well, specific yeah, to the it, statute. It's, it's, it's phrased in the negative, but l let me rephrase it. It's not a, there's no ballot box. Either. Correct. Correct. But the vote, the outcome would be by the majority voting in each town meeting. No, there's, unless the agreement says to the contrary, there's essentially a veto power. Okay, but let's take this scenario. The school committee does what they do, and let's say they went under 16D. We go to town meeting. Dennis approves it, or disapproves it, I should say, or approves it because it's in the negative. Dennis approves the action of the school committee. Yarmouth disapproves it. It's dead. It's dead. Okay. So I guess what Tom's getting at is can't you make the same argument with the ballot that if one town doesn't approve it, it should be dead? Uh, you could make that argument. I think it flies in the face of the language here. It talks about a single election. Right. And it talks about the provided the vote of the district committee authorizing is approved by a majority of the registered voters in the member towns. If it meant that it could be any of the towns could result in the disapproval of that, I, I think it would be specific because they had a model for that. They could have used the, borrowed the language from 16D for that purpose. It talks about the voters in the member towns, a single election. I, I just don't see the how that could be interpreted in in another way i think that's a it's an enormous stretch if, if it said 
that if any single town disapproves of it, then so but be it. But doesn't use the word aggregate vote or the totality of the votes cast in both towns. I mean, I think— it says a majority of the registered voters in the member towns. A majority in the towns, plural. <coughs> so does that mean— It's a single does election that mean on a single the day. the majority of the voters in both towns versus the majority of the voters in each town? I think they— for the converse of the majority in both, I think they would have had to have been more specific. If it's talking about a single election of a majority of the voters in the member towns, and don't forget we have examples of how it's been interpreted in the past, as opposed to the argument that Norm raises and that that Eric and Tracy have both um, had it's had some resonance with both of them, where we're where we're seizing upon an ambiguity in the statute that has been seldom interpreted, if ever interpreted. Mm -hmm. Here we have an example where there's been several examples of, of 16N having been run up the flagpole, so to speak, and been employed in exactly that manner. The fact that each town votes to certify separately is because you have they a have town to. clerk in each yeah. town, they're the yeah. election official, you would have to develop some kind of election official in in the district which would be near impossible given the time frames of these things and also train them on how to do this is there any um did you give any thought or has the issue been raised as to whether or not um the legislature had the power to do what it did with um section 14 d is there any constitutional arguments that could be raised? So it's difficult for me to conceive of a constitutional argument here, given the, the power to, by statute to regionalize. I'm not sure what the constitutional violation Maybe could that be. it um, interferes with freedom of contract between the two towns. I thought the argument regarding taxation might be a little bit stronger than that, you know, based upon what I'm hearing. But again, it's not that people are without rights and due process here to express all of their things. The town voluntarily took on a regional agreement per that's adopted pursuant to various statutes, which were all out there. Um, in, in some ways, someone can make an argument under 16D that if one small town, let's say, in, in that it was the other way in Dennis and Yarmouth really wanted a new school and little Dennis took a vote to kill it, veto it through the 16D process, then we'd be talking about a deprivation of a certain right <coughs> to have your, have your vote have some kind of substance there. Well, I think you could argue, though, in that context, that that's what the parties contracted for originally that's when right. they and entered I think into the regional agreement. But I think that's the same argument cuts in the other direction as well. It's still one person, one vote. It's still a majority. In fact, it's more one person, one vote under 16N than it is under 16D, where when we could develop a, an example that's even more poignant in, say, the, a Western uh, Massachusetts district that might have one really tiny town that beats up uh, a 16D uh, initiative mm -hmm. and kills it just by, by virtue of a town meeting vote at which 30 people could attend. So you, you could see certain equities there. The, this is arguably more democratic in that it's spread across the entire votership. I think it was a calculated gamble on part of the proponents for this. Um, but I think they knew where it would have gone if they had gone 16D, too. Oh, clearly. I, 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 th I think it was definitely a, a measured strategy, no question about it. It, it, it. it was the ball they had to play. And I, th I think that they... They, they faced a little less risk with 16N or, or at least gave themselves a running chance of, of doing it that way. It appears. You, you never know what's going to happen at town meeting. I've seen, we've all seen town meetings get packed with a certain kind of um, voter. Um, and, but I think that they were 
they had reason to be concerned based upon past voting where it may go and thought they would try it. Uh, clearly, that, that, that's what they thought. Otherwise, they wouldn't have tried it. Um, uh, again, I, I, I find resonance with the original argument that, that Norm raised and has been floating around in, in the emails. I don't find as it doesn't make me full of optimism. Um, we could talk about, again, in private, the strategy in approaching that. Um, I think it's uh, it's a it's a difficult animal, but it, it's something that again we we're willing to to try if that's where majority of this board wants to go. Um, it's I think a really difficult <coughs> uh, argument because of all the reasons you've stated, Mike, previously uh, about the the conflicts of statutory interpretation. Uh, section four. There was a very recent case, and I'll, I'll send it to you. It was an, um, by, by the Supreme Judicial Court on a uh, provision um, pertaining to a spouse's right to elect under a will. And it was a 200-year-old provision that had all kinds of conflicts in it. And what, what's interesting is, is not the substance of it, because actually it'll bore you to tears, but the different legal principles they apply and try to reconcile all these conflicting uh, se uh, sections. They lay all of that out in this opinion about what kind of analysis they go through to try to resolve um, statutes that have inconsistent components. And um, that's that kind of thing is what we I think we'd be looking at here. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. I was thinking about this in another context. Very often, because I'm a municipal attorney, I'm, I'm having to defend decisions based upon a network of local bylaws and regulations. Now, I find state law to be imprecise at times and have ambiguities like we're seeing here, but nowhere near the conflicts that we see in local provisions that where sloppy draftsmanship comes up, there are old provisions that back up against new provisions, general bylaws that conflict with zoning bylaws and regulations. This happens all the time. I probably have cited case law a dozen times that says, look, you gotta consider them all mashed up together. Mm -hmm. You can't pit one against the other. You have to see if they work first together. If there's any kind of reasonable way that they could be harmonized in a way that makes sense given the intention of the statute, that's what the courts are going to do. Mm -hmm. They don't like situations where you would say you can uh, you can ignore that that provision altogether. And I think that that's kind of the situation we're in here. Again, notwithstanding uh, the, some reasonableness to that argument, I'm not second guessing it at all. I'm still I'm still bothered, uh, and and in spite of the notwithstanding, because <laughs> if, notwithstanding the notwithstanding, notwithstanding the notwithstanding, <laughs> if. Our towns in 1973, when this was adopted, had uh, said, oh, well, let's let, let's let it go to 16N. All they had to do was not write anything. And then so the then statute. it would have reverted to 16D. Right, but it would have allowed for a two-thirds vote of the school committee to override that. So, so the town could have just, the towns could have just simply omitted any reference to uh, 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 debt authorization, but it, we did not. The two towns specifically said, look, we want to have town meeting decide this and, uh, and put it into the agreement specifically with regard to 14D. I mean, they could have just let the uh, Chapter 71 operate. Yeah, I, I think that we, we would want to because what you'll never get in the head. One thing I know from trying to ascertain intent in adoption of, a, of an agreement, and I've had judges say this to me before that's approved by town meetings, you will never know what the intent of the voters are. What are we going to do, line up the witnesses mm -hmm. from 1973? It doesn't, doesn't work like that. The better argument, again, is that we sit in a gap in the statute, period. Mm -hmm. And that we have to give some force and application to this in some way. And there's a shall that that's how we in, that's how we do debt here in this region, yeah. and this is not a default position. We've made a choice, and that stands in opposition to this notwithstanding language. Mm -hmm. I think that you still get one thing. I would say is that if it didn't say that 
there was a two-thirds majority of the school committee members, I think our argument gets stronger. Mm. But here, there was an obvious effort to say, you get to supersede everything. And, and, and that's, again, another thing standing in our way is like, and we're giving you all notice that if two-thirds of the members, if you have one rabble-rouser town, for example, because that's what 16N is for, to mm. prevent against one block if you have that, we're giving everyone notice that if you get two-thirds of the member of that committee together, you can go another way. But if you have a regional agreement that is I, the, the, the bylaws by which that operates in that town that's been approved by the rebel rouser or not, the small or the big, that's what you have to go by. I don't think you'll find a case where it's specifically in their agreement where it's cho they've chosen to opt for N. I, I can't sit. I'm not. I, I'm not going to take that bet, Tracy, just because I haven't read all the regional agreements, and but if it says we would have to match it up again. I, I think N is probably used, been used just a, a smattering of, of times. And but. I think in the times that it has been used, <coughs> there has not been identified specifically in, in an agreement. Yeah, I would have to. I, would yeah, I think that, that that in itself would be would be uh, revealing. But there's Mark, probably no other cases really that. I would be extremely surprised if you ever had any cases that factually up like this case in a two district um, um, regional agreement where the smaller of the two towns by a minority vote. Well, you're even the bigger one. I mean, two or three town districts. So the big, the big vocational districts fine i think we could probably we obviously yeah. can find some examples there in obviously close to home i've done dozens and dozens of debt authorizations for two and three town districts and every single one of them has been by d and a lot of them have been blocked by that and they move on they carry on yeah. kind of through a nuclear option here mm -hmm. clearly um Again, I, and I'm not, I'm not disagreeing w with some resonance of that argument. I, I think it's a, the more difficult. I would rather be in someone arguing the converse. I'd rather be in the shoes of someone arguing the you converse. You know, I, I hate arguing any of it. It's, it's I, such I an unfortunate situation we're yeah. in. But, yeah. you know, if the people set up a process that they want followed, I think it's our obligation to see it through. If, if it's the will of the people of our community to have a regional agreement that we use, a vote that, that's counted, you know, I, I, I feel bad sitting here trying to argue a point, but at the same time, I don't see how we can't. Yeah, give them an opportunity to, yeah. And if it goes through town meeting and it had past to past you you know mm. you move on and we have that option <clears throat> we could as Jay says meet in executive session and decide right what legal um, course we, we may pursue and you know discuss quantitatively mm -hmm. um, in more detail what the arguments would be um, but as Jay said too um, we can't you, you if we did go that route and we filed a, a lawsuit we'd be seeking a, a declaratory judgment from the court to interpret um the statute uh the various provisions we've discussed here tonight the, the clause uh, d clause n in, in section 14 d and see how that all mashes together but in addition to that um from on a practical level to impede what what is otherwise going to happen you'd have to ask you'd have to get an injunction from the court and so to do that you you'd have to show that you have a reasonable chance of winning the case doesn't mean you'd have to demonstrate you're going to you're going to win but you have a you have a reasonable likelihood of success on the merits is what the standard is so it's it's a two-pronged um challenge well We'd also have to show that the hardship to Yarmouth would exceed the hardship to um, well, what I'm assuming would be the hardship. Yeah, and I don't think and we'd have a, a problem there, but <laughs> I, I think the, the hardship argument is, is pretty evident, I think. But 
Well, I think both could argue hardship. I, I think we'd see oppositions. I'd see, think we'd see there would yeah. probably be two defendants, right? The, the district has the power to sue or be sued. So, Well, it's on our agenda tonight. And how many school people are here? Anybody from the school committee or school district? School building project discussion. Nothing. Not a single one here. For the people at home, they should know that. Yeah. None of them are here. That's how important anything that we've done in this town is to them. Crickets. But, you know, back to what <laughs> Jay said, this, this notwithstanding language of Section 14D is, is daunting. Mark? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I don't really have any more to add. Yeah, I appreciate Jay being here to sort of help at least make every effort to shed some light on this. Um, I do agree with Mike's comments that I think in terms of next steps, I think it's it's more for a discussion in terms of executive session. Mm. I think that's that's where I think I think that's where we're at. What's so. the interest of the board? Do we want to take this uh, at, at the next meeting into executive session? We already, we already, have, an, we already have an executive session at the next meeting. Do we already have one scheduled? Yeah. Yeah, we could right. add just to that. Topic. Okay. Yeah. What's the date of that? Fifteenth, I believe. You know, I think uh, we'd probably, uh, I don't know if there's examples of other town votes uh, around the Commonwealth that uh, uh, I, I know would probably require a fairly substantial amount of research to find out what other votes have, have been like or <coughs> in terms of their agreements and so forth. But you know. I think, but, but I, I think the point is, is that it, it might be interesting for, right. for background, but the argument that we would be seeking really has nothing to do with what other people may have done. It, right. It's either the town people spoke and it's preclusive to the notwithstanding language mm -hmm. or the notwithstanding language supersedes everything. Right. It's a pure question of law. It doesn't require any facts beyond the language of the agreement and the language of the statute. Uh, you know, I'd be curious, do we... Uh, do we have minutes going back as far as 73? Or what, what year was it, 73, 75? 73. But, uh, so, but here's the deal, Eric. The you, the you can't, uh, the, the intent of the drafters of it is irrelevant. Yeah. And, and I think that's not a place we, where we want to be anyway. Right. You would want to keep this. The, the most compelling thing to the court would be pure question of law. No one disputes the fact that the agreement says X and the statute yeah. says X. To get in a debate as to what may have been in the heads, I guarantee we're not going to see a lot of 16N or 14D <laughs> um, thought process going on there. They probably actually took the language from some other regional agreement somewhere. I think, that, again, we could draft quickly, relatively, a document and file it with a motion for an injunction. I think we'd probably give them enough time to respond and and be off to the races. It's really a motion for judgment on the pleadings, Mike. It's... It, that, that that's what it, it stands for. I mean, we might see it in a motion to dismiss too, but I don't. I'm no, not it would be a motion for judgment on pleadings. Right, yeah. but we may see a motion to dismiss, right. notwithstanding yeah. from the other Up side. From them. Right, it would be treated the same yeah. way. Well, given you know that uh, you mentioned their consideration of the fact that uh, the agreement does in fact mention 16D, and they and they mm. talked about that in their proceedings and discussion. Mm. That certainly is a uh, you know. I'd, I can't imagine how they could, uh, in good faith, uh, uh, suggest that dismissal on, uh, would be appropriate since they had already been concerned about yeah. it. Well, we'd cross move for judgment. It would, it would get resolved. I mean, you never know how quickly uh, Barnstable Superior Court acts, but it would sure. it'd be resolved in initial motions. They would move to dismiss, likely. We would cross move for judgment on the police. Unless they reported it. I don't think they would have that interest in doing that, no. the other side. Um, th I, which is, I do think it's a, ca a case that's ripe for appellate review. Yeah, no question. I don't think you're going to find any cases that line up with these facts. I, I just would, I, I'm almost, I'll... We would have found one. I mean, we looked at, at both lower court. There's just, it just it's doesn't a exist. It's unique set of facts. And back to Eric's point about what the parties agreed in the minutes, I mean, the bottom line is I, I don't think it's disputed that 
they agreed upon 16D because right. that's what's in the agreement. And I think a court's going to say there's no issue there. That's what the agreement says. The issue is how does Section 14D, and particularly the notwithstanding provision, how does that impact that agreement? That's the issue. And that was my point about bringing up the, the, the minutes because, again, while I, I agree that you can't judge intent, you know, I can promise you that there wasn't a single person at that town meeting that voted for that regional agreement and the fact that it said 16D, <laughs> knowing that it could be undone by a vote of the school committee. Why do, would you do it? Do you think you could pull, pull together, though, uh, a majority of the members that un even understood what 16D was? But even if, even if <laughs> you know, it's, it, it, that's why I don't think we need it. I think the surface appeal of the argument is is a pure one of law and is as compelling as what may or may not have been in the heads of a, of a few drafters here and there. Uh, it's I not only in the heads of the drafters; it's in the heads of the people who voted for. Well, it. right, which is two different town meetings. Mm -hmm. Both voted in the affirmative to adopt the language specifically using 16D. Right. And continue right. it. In right. I mean, that, that's a no, clear fact. That's an undisputed fact. But in history of our entire <coughs> regional uh, district utilizing that provision consistently. Jay, I haven't done any um, search on the legislative history, but do you know what year 16D came in, whether it came in before, uh, was in existence before the regional agreement or was adop adopted afterwards? I'm. Uh, I, I'm suspecting have, it came in later. I haven't checked with that. I think there's been a review. I actually, hold on a sec. Let me see if I just had it called up. Um, <coughs> just to look at 14D, right? Are you right. thinking? 71 14? 14D, yeah. No, let's see. I would have to go to, to Westlaw. I just have the date. There was a, rev a slight revision of it in 2016. Right. I, I have that revision in, in front of me. I could I could check it. Um, I don't know if it predated or or, or what. Uh, I mean, there's no grandfathering from it, so. Okay. Well, at this stage, if we can uh, put that on the agenda, sure. And then uh, yeah, we'll take that up in executive session. Yeah. Then. Okay. All right. Um, we had also. Uh, uh, plan to talk about, uh, I know at one point there's been, there's been uh, a um, plan circulated with regard to the uh, uh, existing site and, and, uh, I, and I, I still have questions on that and, and Dan, uh, apparently the planning board has been unable to locate yeah. The minutes where the subdivision was approved. My understanding, it was a uh, A and R plan, so it didn't need to have any action. There wouldn't be any minutes in right. an A and R. Okay. Yeah, it was a kind of administrative procedure. So, so the parcel on which our elementary school is located yeah. is uh, parcel A, which was a subdivision that was adopted in 1980, I think. Uh, 1990. I'm sorry. Um, and that parcel is the same one that the new school is going to be put on. So I, I don't understand uh, why the school district went through a subdivision. Back then. Back then. Yes. And assigned the entire parcel to our Station Avenue Elementary School. Now, there's no lease agreement, although the town of Yarmouth built that school, paid for that school, there's no lease agreement uh, for the land on which our elementary school um, uh, stands. So how, I, I guess I don't understand, um, first of all, I'm concerned about coverage. Um, parcel, the parcel uh, that, uh, the subdivision right now is 36 acres and uh, the new building is going to be 180,000 square feet. I don't know what size the elementary school is. So, so as part of the uh, process of moving it forward, the district had to submit to the MSBA site control documents. And the only issue that came up as part of that activity was that triangular piece of property that the town retains uh, as part of a future recreational space. At the time the project was originally 
uh, designed in its footprint that you presently see it today. They had incorporated as part of that site design some of that town parcel. Right, I'm not referring oh, to that though. I know, but, but, but so we had them move it back to all of right. the parcel that they control. Right, but, it, but there was a specific subdivision that was created in 1990. For the Station Avenue Elementary For the Station Avenue Elementary School. And that parcel of land that is, uh, was assigned to the elementary school is now also going to be used for the uh, uh, middle school. And I don't understand how, how that can be if, you know, what the, uh, first of all, are the, are, are the zoning uh, well, requirements I, you know, don't, being don't met? Forget, the project hasn't gone through planning board review yet either. <coughs> so at, su at such time that it's ready to do that, those issues would be addressed at that time. And I would imagine if that's the case, they'll do another and are on the site for the middle school would be my anticipation. Okay, I guess I, I found it very difficult to believe that there was no lease. Yeah, that is that was uh, kind of surprising because it, sp it speaks out in the other buildings very clearly the lease language, but but nobody had any information on why that was never generated for that site. That's correct. Um, so we have a town building, town-owned building, yep. on land that is owned by the district. That's correct. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't know how that flies. And there was and a lot of lease conversations that right. had gone on through the 90s and the 2000s, and that building and all of the stuff that I had read never came up as an issue as to why, why a lease was not put forward for that building. The other ones, MacArthur and Simpkins and all the other buildings, it was clearly stated that the <coughs> lease was not. It's town. Yeah. Whether there was a lease or not, though, I think Norm's point is, I guess, look into the future. What do you do when you have a town-owned building on district land? It does create a lot of problems. Yeah. And what does that do as far as the district's rights to develop that same piece on which the elementary school sits? Uh, that's the better question. Yeah. I mean... Uh, if, if they went to the, the uh, bother of creating a subdivision and assigning a portion of that subdivision to the elementary school, why bother if it wasn't an issue? Uh, you know, I don't know what the, what the thinking was. Um, I'm not sure that it's relevant what the thinking was. It, it seems it, it, somewhat haphazard. <laughs> uh, I'm not. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and they, in fact, filed twice with the planning board because the first one either wasn't acted on or there was some it sort of problem. Yeah. yeah. And it's then automatic when it's not acted on, is it? Isn't the A&R automatic when it's not acted there on? Might have been it can be, but you, you, you kind of have to still have to perfect <laughs> it, but evidently it was recorded, so. Well, I think the lease is an issue, and I think the conveyance of the land where maybe in the last scenario that we were talking about may not have had um, you know importance but I think going back to when the town gave that land what the significance of that amount of land was for is it specifically I mean obviously the district didn't pay for the land the, the right. people of the town gave it to the district for a particular purpose are we thinking that it was for well, I think they bought it didn't they did they I was talking to, uh, you know, Attorney Mike Hayes, yeah. and his dad was on the school committee. I was at his office a few months ago, and he seems to know a lot about that history of, of that land, and I'm pretty sure he, they, he said they purchased it. Well, that was, it was owned by John Sears. Yeah. Well, that's what I've got on this parcel. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and but he, he has all the info on that. So how is that for liability, though, with, with no lease in a building that is owned by the town? From our perspective, I think that's um, problematic. Well, you know, I, I, it's, to me, it's presumptive on the part of the district that the land on which the elementary school sits and which was subdivided for the purpose of that elementary school is now being utilized for something else. I, you know, I, to me, that's it's owned by the district. I don't think the town has any. If it was deeded to the district, I, I'm not sure the town has any. 
rights to that anymore. The district has rights to, to yeah, do with it what they want, unless there's some type of deed restriction on it, which I'm sure it's for educational use. But I, yeah, uh, I just can't understand how we're operating a building without a, a lease when the town owns it, or right. why we would for this long. Right, I don't know. Might be something that we could request that they clean up. Sure. But in the regional agreement? Well, that was supposed to be <laughs> Well, the regional agreement does specify that <coughs> buildings are to be leased. Right. Of course, Maddox is no longer under lease, but that's, I guess, irrelevant. I think all the leases are up anyways, you know, so it's yeah, part of a right. project we never got to. With Everyone's at will at this point. So, okay. Okay, in between now and, and, and next week, when when I see you again, we'll we'll do a little bit more of a survey of what, whatever we can glean just to round out the issue. But I, I think it's gonna be a straightforward uh, decision on whether to try our, our hand at it or not. Yeah. And um, we, we could talk more about assessment and costs and all those other good things. I guess the other issue that has been uh, tossed around at this stage is, is uh, the, the age-old question of deregionalization. And, um, and I, I know you've specified the process, which is not easy. Uh, and I, I guess I've read and reread our agreement. I'm, I'm wondering what's in the state statute now <laughs> that might contradict our agreement. Uh, but, you know, it's interesting that the agreement says that, well, if there's any outstanding debt left, then you then you uh, uh, you're responsible for outstanding debt. Yep. Uh, but it doesn't really talk about other costs. It really leaves that open to negotiation. Uh, uh, other costs were meaning the capital costs of living separately. Right. Right. I mean, it doesn't. It, it doesn't seem to. Uh, the agreement doesn't seem to obligate one town or the other to reimburse the other town for uh, uh, anything other than debt. Uh, uh, agreed. I, I think it would be somewhat of an iterative process, though, whereby as we go through drafts for the the motions and the articles and everything for withdrawal. Um, some of that stuff may get addressed, but more than, uh, to the point, it would likely inform local voters if we were each going to go it alone and what kind of capital needs would we have within our town borders would certainly inform the voters as to how they might like to vote. Let's say, for example, through um, ending or withdrawing from an agreement, it didn't say anything and you were essentially left to your own devices. I think each town would look at what they have within their boundaries, make some determinations as to what more they need and have to do for a period of time. I mean, we, we go through the DESE to process as well to oversee some of this stuff. Not easy. I, I, I think it's difficult to foresee a circumstance whereby that through the process and the agreement there's a withdrawal that that happens easily hmm. a absent some other intervening events that provides a reason for one of the two towns that might not be so willing to jump on board with that uh, that probably isn't the case right now I think the more interesting approach to it that again might be a little more feasible is the special act process but again this isn't exactly the same situation that we describe in the in the multi-town region that in the western part of the state regarding the town of Worthington. So we have a couple of issues there that we would have to uh, overcome, and we would have to do some more future planning to satisfy the legislative the legislature in terms of approval of a special act in terms of the capital needs of not only of Yarmouth but of of uh, Dennis as well. So, you know, but I guess, I guess if we were, if we said, well, we're, we're not going to have a uh, region at all, a regional district at all, and we're, we'll, we'll offer Dennis tuition to our high school. Uh, they can tuition their students to our high school, um, and um, you know we'll we'll take over any middle school that's constructed and use that both for our. our middle school students and our elementary students um, and that would be about the same cash expenditure that uh, we might have to 
make under this current agreement uh, and and then you know go from there sure could be negotiated yeah. you can accomplish I'm, I'm working on a, a yeah. little house renovation right now and as the contractor says there's nothing you can't fix with money mm. <laughs> it's yeah it's what it comes down to right yeah. I mean th there's a component of it too that is quality of education and quality of facilities too uh, obviously but m right. money money is essentially where where would likely come down well, I think I think there's a lot of hidden costs right now in terms of the way the um, enrollment is going. We're in fact picking up a lot of the costs and in being incurred in some of the dentist schools uh, because of retirement obligations as well as their fixed costs, um, and uh, that's very costly to our town right now. And I guess that's, uh, you know, those things have not been quantified. Um, but, um, you know, if we think about that in terms of the uh, elementary school and, and uh, dentists, I mean, it's just, you know, we're, any, of the, any of the retirement or health obligations, we're picking up the increasing shares of those. Well, I mean, it, which isn't to say the town of Yarmouth isn't without some leverage and mm -hmm. to maybe get them back to the, to the table or to the table in earnest once and for all on some tweaking as opposed to a full-blown withdrawal or a complete reorganization of it um, and the the leverage exists through the normal budgeting processes as well as the the processes by which debt may be incurred or other capital expenditures may be and that that is it's a function more of town meeting and occasionally the ballot Not box <laughs> I mean, I, you see, I, and I'm, I'm not, uh, I understand the, the history of it, but it, it is not uncommon, even in towns I, rep, I represent, for tides to turn one way or the other. I, I think I gave the example previously in a two-town region where I represent one of the towns. There was a very heavy-handed school committee, and they grabbed at something and got it one year, and they ended up paying for it at town meeting the next year given the at attendance does shift uh, i'm not suge suggesting that that's been the the history of it we know where the the history has been but well after two there is opportunity after two consecutive overrides uh you know uh, well i guess we'll have to see what happens here so um I don't know if there's any discussion we want further discussion we want to have on that, or if we want uh, staff to do anything at this stage with regard to the calculations. Well, that. But did you also want to discuss any communication to the school committee sooner rather than later? Yeah, I think we need to we need to do that. Um, you know, I had put together a, a, a draft of a letter with a, a whole laundry list of things to say, and I, and a, um, you know, uh, I don't know if. Uh, I, I guess first of all, I think the my understanding is, uh, and Dan, correct me if I'm wrong on this. The school committee has gone through the proposed agreement that we put in front of them. Um, I think it's fair to say that they reviewed it enough to request that the superintendent communicate with both towns to put a placeholder on the uh, warrant for their spring meetings for a uh, amendment to the agreement okay. what that ends up looking like or what kind of discussions they've had uh, there from I think the meeting just before the break it wasn't really of any great significance or detail mm -hmm. but enough to say that to signal to, to the administration to let us know that there would be an agreement coming of some shape okay. or form all right um, I guess I was under the impression that they had uh, uh, looked at the well they may have they've hashed out a few things that have been publicly stated in newspaper articles by various members of the school committee that i've seen okay. so they're aware of the conditions they've all read it okay they i think they know from communications what has been reported as to what our desire line they spoke i think at that meeting in december before the break they know that our number was more like 60 40. Mm -hmm. With regard to capital, yes, yeah. and that 2.9 million, they know that for the yeah. fixed cost piece. I thought they had already yeah. uh, said that they would 
plan to include that in the agreement? I, uh, until a vote lays down, I don't really know what, <laughs> what you're going to get. Yeah. I see. Okay. Well, I don't know. Yeah, what is, uh, uh, is there a, a sense on the board of whether we should get on record? Uh, I guess what that's really what I was suggesting is that we get on record with the school committee. Um, you know, I think uh, we previously offered to meet with them or uh, try to go through some of the things that were discussed at the negotiating committee level. They have not acted on that. They haven't asked us to come before them. The Finance Committee voted last night to send a letter, which I have a draft of, that will um, authorize tomorrow to the chairman, and it, it addresses <coughs> two points specifically, the $2.9 million in fixed cost and then the capital share. Okay. Yeah. So they're... They're going to go on record and get that sent to the school week. committee. Yep. Okay. All right. Um... What, uh, does our board want to do anything at this stage, or is? Um, That'd be good to see what piggyback on that letter. Well, mm -hmm. they did. They did have a discussion, and I believe that there were there were no votes taken. Um, but it came down to a discussion of where we where we'd lie, basically. What? Not we weren't going to be happy. They weren't going to be happy. Somewhere in the middle. And mm -hmm. so I think just uh, sending a letter as to <coughs> our position on why why we were at a certain percentage. You know, they're going to do with it what they want. So, but I think just sending sending something that outlines uh, the rationale for the number that we requested. Okay. Um, well, I had put this together. Uh, you know, I certainly would like some. You know, if there's further comments uh, on on this draft, um, then you know, we if we can get those together in the next few days. And get and then uh, put that out to them. I think, I think it would be useful to have something in front of them before their next meeting, because I think that they might. I would hope that they would move ahead, to some degree. Um, I I don't expect everybody to reread this while we're sitting here and and uh, uh, make uh, make suggestions on it. But um, does that meet with everyone's approval? Yeah, I read yeah. it when you sent it, and I didn't. I didn't. Okay. It was fine. Okay. Fine. So if we have, uh, we'll yeah, I'll, um, try I'll to get something out. Yeah, I'll put it for you tomorrow. Okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. That's fine. Um, anything else on this topic at this point? <coughs> while we have Jay. Oh, no, it's a to be continued. We're, we'll dig in a little, even a, right. we'll take a look at some of the examples and the margins just so we could have a good, robust discussion in private next week. Look forward to yeah. it. Makes sense. All right. Terrific. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jay. Okay. Thank you. All right. Uh, we'll move on. Uh, our next agenda item. Good evening. Okay, great. And welcome. So, um, Kathy, do you have a team with you, or are you? Um, uh, Jerry Bedard is here with the Age Friendly Team, and I invite <laughs> okay. um, Jenny Sutherland and Todd Funk up from Windsor to join me. Okay. And we have representation from Melissa Wiedemann for the Alzheimer's Family Support Group okay. as well. Great. So I hope that you will find that this is a bit more of a harmonious presentation um, because we're talking uh, about really great stuff about a private and public um, collaboration and um, at no cost to the town of Yarmouth so this should be a bit more harmonious for all of you guys uh, I'll take you down the history first of specifically the dementia friendly element of the age friendly community work we are um, a livable community for all ages Pat has agreed my fearless leader to um, click through the PowerPoint presentation. Okay, so I'll talk and then Pat can catch up. Okay, thank you, Pat. 
Um, the eight domains of an age-friendly community are applicable to a dementia-friendly community as well. So when you think of friends and neighbors that have any cognitive behavior issues, whether it's dementia, Alzheimer's, or any other issues, think about how difficult it might be to live in this community and um, participate in outdoor spaces and buildings, transportation, live in the existing housing stock, participate even, say, in this meeting. Um, and feel respected and included, participate. How, how does that work for employment and our caregivers? And how do we communicate information to people in this population and the caregivers as well uh, through our health and support systems? Next, Pat. So I wanted to bring uh, the Board of Selectmen, I don't know why this is off center, but we'll live with this. We know that the uh, in the community compact signed by the governor that they recognize age and dementia friendly, and I wanted to bring your attention to what that best practice is, because you get check boxes now, right, in your uh, best practices, and we checked off quite a few in the age friendly domain, um, but overall it says age friendly is a community that is livable for residents of all ages, inclusive of older older adults and those with living with dementia. Age-friendly communities strive to be equitable, I think Mike likes that word, uh, accessible with walkable streets, housing and uh, transportation. It's not me, it's the law. <laughs> <laughs> uh, access to services and opportunities for residents to participate in community activities. So these three specific best practices, what I, I want to bring them to your attention. Yeah, I don't know why this is. At home, it's, it's, it's okay, guys? Okay, thank you, Tracy. So um, one is to review municipal policies and regulations with the goal of promoting aging in place. So one of the questions we've posed to you in the past is can we make an age and dementia friendly uh, a goal of the Board of Selectmen in some way uh, through this uh, Envisio project that, thank you, Tracy. That makes it easier on me. Now that's an age-friendly approach right there. <laughs> I am aging after all, in all policies. Yeah, we sure are. Well, hopefully the alternative is, is not as great. So uh, where can we uh, make changes in our policies? The other best practice that we can continue to focus on is to create uh, databases and information and how we communicate that through our website and our newsletter to, with ease for the people in our community that are aging or suffering from dementia and Alzheimer's, right? Are we really mindfully doing that? I would say the answer to that so far on our website and even in our newsletter is probably not. not we're probably not getting an A-plus on that. Um, to develop policies and services to, to promote the elder economic security index. And we do great stuff like the tax work off program. But um, we may look for some language reform in existing policies to continue those improvements. And at the last presentation, we cited something about the CPA grant funding stream. And I guess there's questions about that at the state level now anyway in reform. So, so that just goes to show you that we are in a time that people are looking at existing uh, constructs and getting creative to make room and space for age and dementia friendly communities. So what is the team looking at? Um, we're still working with Mark to get the uh, disability commission com started. We have three great applicants and, and he's been moving through that process. Why is that important to dementia? Those people fall in that population, right? They would be better represented with a disability team in place to look at our policies and also to seek grant funding. For example, there was a $250,000 grant that was available through the state last year that had we had that team in place, we could have pursued that and attacked some issues and challenges that we have in the town to improve ourselves. So hopefully next year we'll be positioned to do so. Uh, the compliment that comes down in tonight's meeting that I'll illustrate for you is that um, by doing a partnership with our friends at Windsor, we are addressing the shortfall that Eric um, once asked me to explore about, you know, adult day services. And I think 
four of you probably remember that presentation, and Eric was very concerned about the fact that there was no adult day service program at that time. Windsor had started to close theirs down, our senior center, unlike Barnstable and Dennis and Orleans and East Ham did not have that provision, and it was very difficult for someone, maybe a neighbor, to find a situation. So tonight we're going to show you that through us providing a robust transportation system and Windsor st stepping back in to build up that program and potentially another community entity, a private entity, we can solve this problem without it being completely at the taxpayer's cost, which is really exciting. Um, and this is where you will be ahead of Dennis financially for a change. Maybe that's harmonious for you. Uh, so uh, when we got the M Mass Council on Aging grant to look at our dementia-friendly community possibilities, they did an analysis and they came away with these two large things that you need to be aware of. That one of the biggest challenges was that um, the municipal leaders on dementia and age-friendly Yarmouth, while we were the catalyst for uh, the, the CAPE, and now all 15 towns are signed on to work on this, and there's a big collective energy going on across the Commonwealth supported by our governor in our best practices. The Tommy Yarmouth leadership really hasn't come out with a statement other than being very respectful at our presentations to lead the way and really bless this office, something, a point of pride, and a point of marketing your community and correlating it to tourism and the possibilities. So I would ask you to really think about that. Many on our team have said that's because we never asked you for money and things don't become a priority unless you ask for money. But I would also make the case that you should be very proud of a team that has never asked for money and done all this work for you for free. So if you really believe in exercising your citizens to get work done for you at zero cost, I wouldn't have to ask for money to make this be a priority and have it be in the goals, okay? Um, so the other thing that they've asked us to do is they said, you know, where you were the leaders on Cape Cod on this issue, we need you to be at these meetings uh, across the Cape, across the state more often and continue to lead. You, Yarmouth. So Yarmouth is leading in this area and is known as a leader in this area. And so as the governing body, you have to decide, do you want that leadership role or don't you? And if so, how do we approve? How do you make it easier for Pat, my boss, to say to me, yes, Kathy, your time at these meetings is important because right now she probably can't do that with ease. Sorry, Pat. I know you want to say yes. <laughs> the SWOT analysis. So a good SWOT analysis came from the uh, Dementia Friendly Capacity Report as funded by the MCOA and written for us by the Alzheimer's Fa Family Support Group. Melissa Wiedemann is here tonight um, to represent Molly Perdue's organization, which would like to relocate here to Yarmouth. And that is an interesting thought for you because the Alzheimer's F Family Support Group that takes care of all of the CAPE, right, and it's a local agency really t tuned into what we do on Cape Cod and the needs of Cape Cod is directly connected to NYU and their research on dementia. It would be a feather in Yarmouth's cap to consider how we would court Molly's organization to be located here. And, and Dan was gracious enough, and Pat, uh, and Mark, to show up at a conceptual meeting at Mattakees just to talk about, well, how could that look? Where would that look? Maybe not in Mattakees, but somewhere in town. Does it matter for us to put our flagship up on this uh, dementia and age-friendly community work? Maybe it doesn't to you, maybe it does, but I'm asking you to think about that. So your opportunities are um, to have intermunicipal and privately funded adult day programming, which is what we're proposing that we've already accomplished tonight. That's an opportunity. Your strengths are as cited. And your weaknesses and your threats are the lack of, of leadership that has validated this program. Um, we don't have a strong presence of grant writers dedicated to taking in all the advantages of age and dementia friendly possibilities right now. We, and we don't um, really have great training for all of our caregivers and our um, municipal workers about how to, um, 
how to exist in a dementia and age friendly population. Like what does dementia and Alzheimer's mean? Our, our first responders do go so, through some training, but there is better training available to us and we could execute upon those things. Thank you. You're really great at this, Pat, thank you. So, um, Windsor is here with us tonight. Uh, we approached Todd Funk when he took the position as director and we said, listen, you know, Windsor has had at one time an adult day program and it had closed its doors. It had its tra challenges. We'd like to see if you can open it again. We recognize that it would be very costly to put an addition on the Senior Center and or lease a building to build our own adult day program. We would love for you to get back in the business. And Todd, as a new director, quickly responded and said, guess what, Kathy, uh, you know, we're going to do just that. So I will introduce you again to our new friends that are going to talk about what that's going to look like for our town at zero dollars to you at great cost to them because one known entity in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts and you can ask your friends in Barnstable and Orleans and in Dennis because we're in a down economy they always put adult day services on the chopping block in the budget you don't even have to go back to 73 for that data maybe just eight years um, and, and this allows us not to get on that chopping block, block and only think about the transportation, which is a really small share of the cost. Again, I'm Todd Funk. I'm the administrator of Windsor Skilled Nursing and Rehabilitation Center. I assume most of you are aware of our facility in town. Um, we're a 120-bed skilled nursing facility. It's owned by Berkshire Health Systems. It's uh, based out of the western part of the state, although there's roughly three in the Cape area. Just general background. I came to the home uh, four and a half months ago. Been in the industry for 29 years. Started when I was in my 20s as a nursing home director. Uh, here I am uh, in Yarmouth trying to make a change with a home that's had uh, uh, some issues uh, a couple few years back, uh, building a new team. And part of this was connecting with the Yarmouth Senior Center and talking uh, with them about uh, how do we build a relationship. First thing was, well, we'd like to get back uh, to have a conversation about adult day health. I won't belabor the conversation, night's getting old. I'll let Jenny go ahead and take us through what we're trying to do. Oh. First off, thanks for having us tonight. I want to apologize. I, I have a wicked cold, and it's at the end of it. And it's 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 very um, well. It's good for some people because I talk a lot. So, um, but I apologize if I have a coughing fit. So. Windsor is part of Berkshire Healthcare Systems. Um, Windsor's been with us for 30 years and with you for 30 years. I've been with Berkshire for 20 years. We're not for profit. We've never been for profit. Uh, we're only in Massachusetts. Um, I started off part-time on the weekends as an activity aid because I wanted uh, to make a difference in some folks that were older um, because I lost my grandmother and great-grandmother in the same year, um, and I missed them. Um, I went from working from with Yankee Candle to wanting to make uh, life better for, for some folks at the end of their time. Um, and now I get to do a whole lot of cool stuff, and, and one thing I'm proud of is um, you know, my, my new friend here said it, that adult day health is, is tough. There, there's no, we're not looking to make money here. Uh, our uh, mission and vision is to provide the services that the community needs. I spent a lot of time, even before Todd knew it, looking into adult day health because Berkshire was interested in resurrecting our adult day health programs. So, um, I, I called your home care agencies in the area. I called a bunch of people. Um, I actually spent time in your community. I had breakfast with some folks this morning at one of your local places because I want to know who you guys are. Uh, sitting here tonight was interesting, and, and no, it's it's cool. No, listen, this is good stuff. This this is what we're about, uh, and I'm proud of that. I'm sorry it's a struggle though. It really is. Um, so we're committed to getting the adult day health program up and running again at Windsor. 
Um, I've spent time learning about this, um, trying to get it so it's it's very, um, what do I want to say? For the client who's coming into the day program, so they have a good time, have a quality life where they feel good about themselves. A lot of the folks we're talking about have dementia and they don't feel good about themselves. And so for however long they're with us, they're succeeding, they're have, making friends, they're getting supported, while their caregivers are taking care of themselves, maybe going to a doctor's appointment, running errands, or maybe just taking a nap. Um, and in our lives, sometimes we need skilled nursing facilities and sometimes people can take care of their loved ones at home. Berkshire wants to be part of whatever people need. So adult day health programs really can help that. Um, and it's not just for the person attending daily, it's for the caregivers who are trying with pretty much no pay to take care of their, their folks. So I, I know you have questions and I want to hear what you guys want. I know transportation is a thing. Uh, so I just, before I, I send it back to you for your questions, in Great Barrington I just rebooted one. It's the same size as the program in Windsor. Transportation is the issue. It's, a, it's an issue across the whole state. There's no transportation for seniors that are, help, you know, there's little bits and I, I don't want to dis count what there is in the community because I'm grateful for that but certainly folks need more transportation um, but in Great Barrington uh, the program was suffering they had one client for about a year and nobody was putting any effort into it and now I've rebooted it I reprogrammed it so that the day is is much more of value and there's things to do there uh, we're serving breakfast and lunch besides two snacks um, we can take care of a higher medical things. If, if folks have diabetes, we can check blood sugars. Um, we can dip urine so folks don't have to take their loved ones to the doctor's office, which is another trip they don't need to do um, because we're going for a higher level of care. Um, What's important to know about this program is, is we went from one, and in a month and a half that we've been really trying to build census, we're up to 18 slots filled, which is a big deal. Um, the program runs Monday through Friday, and if we only have one person, you know, it, so it's, we can only have 11 people per day. It's a small program, which is great, because of the size, you get that intimacy and stuff like that. So we have 55 slots. So we're building at a good pace, but the people we do have coming are really enjoying it. Elder Services of Berkshire County is referring to us in Great Barrington. Um, we have a woman who um, never worked out in the community, took care of her kids and her husband, has dementia, her husband's disabled, started coming one day a week, now she comes five days a week and she's looking for the, the bus to pick her up on Saturdays and Sundays because she feels good about her day. And her husband said that they're getting along better because he's not getting frustrated anymore and he gets a break. So I wanted to end you with that story because that's why I do this work. That's why I've done it for 20 years is to make a difference in people's lives. That's why Berkshire does it. We listen to the community in Great Barrington that needs this. I think there's um, a call for the adult day health in your community uh, that we'd like to, to meet. So if you have questions about adult day health programs, let them rip. I'm ready for you. <laughs> Harmonious. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> it's like almost 8 o'clock there, sister. <laughs> they just talked about B16 or whatever the heck they were talking about. Well, we'll D open up uh, and uh, see if uh, board members have any questions or observations at this stage. Out on the sun. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, first of all, uh, thank you, Kathy, uh, Jenny, Todd, Melissa, for being here tonight to talk to us about this. Um, I would say I believe that within the board, um, you'll hear strong support and enthusiasm. I'm I'm very interested in this, in the work that you're doing and the work of the committee, and I'm, I welcome the idea of a plan May 2019, and hearing more about some of the specific things that we can do uh, to help sort of move this agenda forward. I think that's something that uh, I'm certainly looking forward to seeing. Um, in your presentation. Uh, I want to echo a comment about the lack of affordable choices for continuing care. 
Um, I think when we talk about the housing crisis and the living crisis on Cape Cod, this is something that often gets forgotten. Um, but it's just as critical as all of the other housing issues that we're wrestling with right now. And I think this is an area where I think if we can in this plan spend some more time thinking about ways we can help address that, I think that would be an important service for us because the affordable housing and the housing initiatives that we're all looking at fit a certain profile, market housing, quote, designated affordable housing, but we tend to forget this part of the market. And I think one of the reasons why many, I mean, there are many elders, seniors that want to live at home, but there are also many that would want to downsize and go into a place where um, there's a more affordable arrangement, but the problem is, is there's no place to go. And you know, so we're losing people in our community, and I think this is uh, part of the housing crisis on Cape Cod that gets lost, gets forgotten, and I think one of the things that we have to do, and maybe it's through this plan, is to help further draw attention to this issue. Um, you know, one of the things Barnstable County did years ago is it actually helped underwrite the development of an affordable uh, assisted living facility. And um, the, the one that I'm talking about is in Bourne, I believe. And um, I think that, is, that was done years ago, and I think that's the only time we've seen a government, whether it's municipal or county, step up and really engage you know, in trying to do something. But maybe there are partnership opportunities, particularly in some communities where they may have surplus land or blighted land or some other areas where the town can be a partner in helping facilitate. You know, because when, when we talk about revitalization, you know, uh, this is an area where there's huge need. And healthcare in this area is also in a big part of the Cape's economy. Mm -hmm. And I honestly believe that as we look at improving infrastructure on Route 28, um, I do believe that one of the things that we have yet to really explore is the extent to which it can help facilitate and support um, growth in that part of our local economy. Um, I, s I see huge opportunities there and good jobs there as well. So I think the fact that you're doing this and you're exploring these partnerships with other organizations, um, I'd love to find a home uh, for Melissa and th the rest of the gang over there. They, they do wonderful work and the, wor the workload is growing. And that's just it. And I think, um, I think it could be a huge service to uh, the town of Yarmouth. Um, I also, with respect to Windsor, I did not know you were nonprofit. Um, but I think that's important for people to understand because we often hear and we, I think we, some of us have the prejudice or the sense that uh, nursing homes are all profit making. And the fact that you're a nonprofit, I think, is very, very important for all of us to understand. And the fact that you're talking to them and we're figuring out ways to work together, as I think, is great to see. I, I applaud it completely. I think it's wonderful. And doing adult daycare services is terrific. Um, because we all know that's a huge need in this community. And if we can work together to help you facilitate that, I think that's fantastic. I think it's outstanding. Um, I'd love to know if there's other than cheerlead and applaud and say thank you, I don't know if there's anything else that we can do to help facilitate that. But this is another area. Station budget for the senior center is exactly what we can work on. Okay, yeah. that's good. So that's that we can make sure that when they open their doors that we can move the people with consistency through our, our Voyager van system. Yeah. It's definitely something that we need to be able to make that pledge to the community. Instead of asking you for $2 million to build an adult day program, you know, we'll ask you for 50000 to make sure we can transport people. I think that's a heck of a great trade-off, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, all good points. So um, I'm interested in other things that we can do to help collaborate with you. Um, I, I, I appreciate you for dedicating your career, your work in this area. It's very, very important. I've known a lot of people that have been there that have stayed there. And uh, I'm hoping that uh, in, in, in due course we can find other things that we can work on together. So thank you for being here tonight and talking about all, all your good work. So thank you. I just want to piggyback on something that you said. Um, Berkshire Healthcare is in pretty much all of the counties in, Ma in Massachusetts, and in Berkshire County, there's different housing opportunities for seniors. Um, so 
what we're doing now is partnering with a lot of different organizations so there might be opportunities to speak with you about that and give you some ideas i'm, I'm glad i'm glad you pointed that out no, I, think, seriously. I think i think that's what you bring to the table that can really help us out a lot is learning from the lessons in other parts of the commonwealth where you're providing help where there may be some opportunities that we might be able to pursue i think that's a great point and i appreciate you raising that for, for me to be able to work in the different areas of massachusetts i, I can see the differences for sure but I can also see the similarities your community is very similar to Great Barrington and North Adams in Berkshire County with the tourism the, s the seasonal people and the, and the long-term folks and things so um, you know it's a good opportunity thank you Um, I'm pretty much on the same page with Mark. I, I've been through this adult daycare scenario in my own personal life with, with my mother. And um, um, while it's important, obviously, to have a, a respite component for people that deal um, and care continuously for patients with dementia, which is an extraordinary challenge and a, a very weary and tiresome um, ordeal. The other component, though, is the quality of the program for the person that is suffering dementia. Even though they have dementia, as you know, that doesn't mean that, um, you know, they're just looking for a place to deposit somebody. The socialization is very important to those people as it is to everybody else. Um, I was fortunate because when my mother was going through that, I had a brother that was a good licensed clinical psychologist, and he was monitoring that aspect of her care, which was great. And um, she was at the Weldon Center down in Springfield, which was a, a sure. pretty highly acclaimed yeah, adult no. daycare um, place. She didn't want to do the five days, but he talked her into, I think, eventually like three. But that was important in, in, in terms of his professional judgment to her ability to sustain where she was. Um, we also, we're also all social beasts, all social animals, no matter what our condition is. And I think sometimes people forget that, and they think they're just people that they can warehouse. So I guess my question to you in that regard is, what do, what are your uh, efforts in terms of providing that kind of qualitative service to those people? And what, if any, professional input do you have when you develop a, a, a program for adult daycare? So that's probably the best question you can ask me. Um, so in, in my 20 years, um, I've been an activity director. I'm certified activity director. I am qualified to program a dementia unit um, or neighborhood in a long-term care facility. To me, this is about the person, so it's what they like. So there's a lot of focus and interview on, on what you would like and what you would like if you're part of the program and blending that together. Also individual things. So I'm about the person. I don't warehouse. I've been fighting that for 20 years. Um, when I started in this industry, you'd put people in a room and you were a babysitter. Um, and, and these people are still alive and living and that's what they need to have every day is a life. Sometimes, uh, you know, you need to have a good time and, and have a social party and things like that. Sometimes you need to be challenged cognitively. Sometimes you need to get a little competitive uh, or, or good at some, some mini sports where we get that out. Sometimes you need to have a good kind of debate, like I heard tonight, and it gets your adrenaline going and you get your opinions. But you need to feel a value and that you're still worth something. So what I do is... is try to promote everybody having a good day and that means feeling like they're still of value even though they might not remember stuff in the moment they do um, and they're having those feelings so this is very important to me uh, and folks who suffer from dementia and the folks who don't suffer from dementia who come to the program because they can't take care of themselves all day and need a break um, need to have a good quality life just like we do life doesn't stop just because you need more help and you lose some of your abilities I've been working on this 20 years so uh, the adult day health is just another opportunity for us to help folks I, I'm, I don't like that every day we don't have Windsor open that people are missing the opportunity and they're not having as good a days as they could be having if we just moved 
along with this. You know, someone tomorrow is going to be sitting there at home in a chair doing nothing. Um, so th this is what I'm fighting for, man. Same thing you are. I got gotcha you on this. I, I don't, I don't want to warehouse them. I think that's terrible. Yeah, and there's there's the in between too, where they're not warehouse, but they're not exactly stimulated or provided with the the environment that sure. they can experience the things that you're talking about. Sure. So that's that's programming, and that's learning who these folks are. Um, again, not everybody wants to participate at the same level. They can be sitting to the side, but still seeing things and engaged. People that aren't challenged. Yeah. I like that too. They're all yeah, different. Yeah. Exactly. And, and you know, if you if you ask ask me, uh, what did you do today? I'll tell you nothing. And if I asked you, what did you do today? you will say nothing. If you go home and ask your kids, what did you do today? I did nothing. Well, they might have had the best day of their lives, and they're going to tell you nothing. And that's the same thing with, with these folks. You know, you got you to gotta try and do stuff. But there is programming. It's not just coming in and doing nothing. The TV is not on. It's not just this and that. But it changes just like... If, because of your participants. So for a period of time, they could be into, say, sports, because you have some fans. And it could change that they're into arts and crafts or games. So it's, it's keeping, um, you know, knowing the clients. I hope that answers some of it. Yeah. The, other, the other observation or point I wanted to make is, um, we've talked about this before, Kathy, about programs for the elderly, opportunities for the elderly. Uh, it's all going to really boil down to accessibility and um, this is no different so I like to see the budget and I would definitely be in support of providing that accessibility to these people yeah, um, great Mike I appreciate that support because accessibility is the transportation the affordability element um, and that's why we hope to we're very excited looking forward and when we come back in the spring the age friendly team to make a presentation to y'all uh, about some of these conceptual housing um, projects on the 19th of December we had another really cool meeting to talk about congregate housing and the PACE program and things that address some of these issues and Yarmouth can have a leadership role there as well um, so uh, the other access accessibility and this is why we're looking for funding streams that we can influence language change in uh, is how do we use technology for our homebound elders to participate in a meeting like this to be a program for stimulation because my experience is I can na uh, name two gentlemen uh, John Gibson and William Painter professors retired professors that I was privileged because of my job to spend time with and learn from and they had so much to give as they aged in your community there are many in our community that we can benefit from and technology should lead the way for that so we need to really think seriously about how we can lead in that direction too I would make the case that that would be an economic uh, development opportunity for the town and correlates to tourism because people that travel to visit their aging seniors as they go through all the stages and want um, to know that they have a robust lifestyle here in Yarmouth right and uh, so that's part of that pitch Jenny, your passion is infectious, and you can tell that you love what you do, and I think it's wonderful, and you've teamed up with the right person. So um, we as a community are um, better for that, and I see really good things happening. The conversations, as Mark said, is um, a first step. Mm -hmm. um, but everything that we do um, is about providing a better quality of life. And so um, Alzheimer's and dementia is a full family disease. And um, any respite, not only for um, the person who has dementia or um, Alzheimer's, but for the caregiver, it is um, whatever, whatever it is that we can do. I think it helps the whole family, and it helps them um, feel like they're in a community that cares so and we have a significant aging population higher than um, I think you'd see in a lot of uh, I think this the data shows probably some of the highest numbers in the state yeah up there 40 percent yeah. uh, for the Cape in general which um, 
you know, no disrespect to Western uh, Mass, I, I would make the case that uh, the Cape should be the uh, leadership area for aging, change, and reform for the whole nation because of the high volume of seniors and because of some of the variety of conditions from great wealth to great poverty. So um, I, I appreciate it. I know that I'm sure you're more of an expertise in terms of programming and um, things like that. But as far as outreach in um, hours and necessity and whatever the barriers might be, have we been, been able to identify that it's specific at this point really to transportation or um, how are we going to, when do you plan on beginning, I guess, and how can people start that process of, um, how, of connecting, making the connections for um, the senior center or for us to be able to, um, the people that we know, direct them to you? Sure. Well, um, so we, we've started. Um, we've connected with the Department of Public Health. They have um, to reissue our license. So I'm going through that process at Windsor. We've posted for um, leadership of the program and staffing. Um, as soon as we hire that person and get some things in place, I, I'm, I'm looking at within the next two months um, to get this up and rolling, if not sooner. Um, this is a little different scenario than I'm used to. I mean, I mean I've revamped one that didn't shut down for a little bit. Uh, so this is interesting. The state's never done this before either. So um, what I can do is, is keep this young lady abreast of the situation. Um, but the outreach is very important because I don't want anyone to miss the opportunity to hear about it um, and take advantage of the program if they need it. So that's going to be key. And, and part of that is going to be me getting the word out into your community and if there's folks who have any ideas how we can do that um, I'd love to hear them there'll be an open house and some different things um, so people can see it um, the other does that answering yeah, yeah. no I, I guess I'm more specifically like when it closed was it yeah. due to numbers or was it a financial no. scenario for Windsor what was what's what why has it not been as successful as we yeah. think that it may have possibly well, been. So here's the thing. <laughs> Adult Day Health, in the industry that we're in, for the longest time weren't of, of that value. And that's true. Um, just like rest homes. Everyone wants a skilled nursing facility because that's where you make money, you get reimbursement. So as Berkshire Healthcare has evolved with our mission and vision and connection to the community, we're listening more to what the community needs. So this goes back right to the first question of us being a not-for-profit. This is not the smartest business move for us. It really isn't. Um, so our leadership and our board of directors who, who um, sit on our board know that I mean, I, I've spent a lot of time on numbers, more numbers than I've ever done in my life because I want this to happen. I could care less about numbers. I, I told my math professors I'd never do numbers, but I did numbers for this. And I'm just going to break even. We're not looking to make money. We're meeting the needs of the community, not just yours, but others, that there are people that need a day program. They, they can go home at night and, and still have that life, but their caregivers and them need a break for whatever reason. You can think of thousands of scenarios. So for the longest time, wasn't the way we were going. It kind of fell apart. Berkshire looked at uh, ourselves and we said, can we do this? And our president, Bill Jones, and I were having a meeting about this group called Soldier On. It's, it's a group of veterans that are homeless that he has had me work with for the past year. And uh, it came up that adult day health programs. And he said, go, go see what you can do with them. So this has been me, our president, Bill Jones, and a couple other people mucking around trying to get this going again. We're taking pressure off of affiliates by me doing it. 
Um, so yeah, no, it wasn't finance. It was we didn't think it was a value. We weren't listening to the community. Now we're listening. Tracy, to talk about the logistics, so we'll work with them to make sure that we can provide the transportation. We now have two vans, um, and um, and that will address that space. How do we get people to and from? Uh, it, traditionally, that's been part of the um, problem for the model is uh, the way the reimbursement goes for the Medicare piece of it is that if you know there's a bad weather bad storm they still have to pay for that staff because there's really strict rules about how many staffing and of what educational level has to be available and how the facility has to be configured that's where the big costs are right um, and so the transportation pieces that piece we can relieve but we can we can deliver that in the structure of their open hours um, and then we have another entity looking in town uh, uh, to develop another situation um, for adult day services and we're trying to work with her to make sure that that goes as planned uh, and we could even look at uh, agreements to how if there's space open in Dennis or Barnstable how we transport to those places to keep us out of the space of the business and provide the transportation element is the best solution in my opinion for the town of Yarmouth um, but we have to make a pledge to something we don't get out of it completely um, and I think the encouragement of another entity and this public introduction of Windsor keeps the pressure on uh, the quality of services with expectations Expectations, and I also believe that the collective impact work by the dementia and age-friendly um, community work across the Commonwealth, right? Like we're in a big competition with New York right now, Massachusetts and New York, and you know the Red Sox are going to win this one, right? We're going to do it better, <laughs> and we're going to do it. We're going to lead in Yarmouth, and this is a good model for others to follow. So uh, it's it's never easy to start something new, and there will be a lot of expectations, but hopefully it takes us to what er Eric originally asked for two years ago without a big ticket burden for the town I'm hopeful as well and I think um, perhaps uh, channel 18 can do something with the two of you that can be shared on yeah. also on social media is and played on so people are aware of it because I mean honestly if you're successful we're successful meaning the people of our community and the quality of life so I think the partnership is a good one and I'm excited to see what the future has I, I'm a little nervous about the two-month window without the funding for next year how that's gonna mm. work but I'm sure we're gonna ease into it with the number of people um, unless you have a, a boom but um, you know anything that we can do to help I, I appreciate your work yeah Thank you. thanks Tracy and I really think that really you have to notice the improvement to services is directly related when we gave our first presentation about Yarmouth being a member of the World Health Organization age-friendly community network Tracy you were at that presentation when we invited the region in Berkshire Martha's Vineyard and Boston were the other entities that were also in this game of age-friendly community building and so that presence and conversation using that category and that framework to shift the conversation from how does a town just think about programming at a senior center to think holistically how seniors are aging in your community from the ho complicated housing topic right across the board how do we collaborate not just in our municipal departments but with nonprofit entities like the Alzheimer's Family Support Organization that gets great funding for some of this caregiver respite that you're talking about and our friends at Will Windsor and our friends at um, the Mill Hill residences and how they hosted the Chinese delegation to come in and talk about dementia for their ch for how to figure it out in their country so these partnerships are really great and they're right here in Yarmouth and they are a point of pride um, well thank you Kathy and Jenny and Todd and Melissa for coming in tonight and for enduring that first hour and a half. Yeah, make sure you give Janice a hard time for tapping out early. Um, she did. <laughs> uh, you know, as someone who I have a unique perspective in that I have both sides of the spectrum in my life. I have the kids in the school and I have an, an elderly grandparent. Until recently I had two. But it boggles my mind that we sit here and then for the first hour and a half of this meeting we start, we're talking about spending a hundred million dollars and here we're you know you're asking us you know we need 50 grand to come up with a 
to come to pay for transportation so that the, the so that the largest segment of our population can you know have these kinds of services so uh, you know I'll, I'll cut to the chase and I think based on what Mike said he kind of he may share my feeling you know there, there are two things one other besides it, it bothers me that you're missing out on grants um, so you know my, my question would be two part you know <clears throat> What does it cause? Can you, is there such a thing as a as a as a um, you know for hire grant writer? Um, that's the first question. And number two, you know, I strongly believe that if Berkshire Health and Windsor are going to um, reopen this program, that we should be supportive. Um, and if fifty thousand dollars is the number. You know, you're sitting there at a good time when we've got three million dollars worth of free cash to kick around. Um, so, you know, you need to ask. And, and when I say ask, you know, they come back with one of those school type budgets that says, oh, you know, we need, we need 10 million more, but, you know, we'd really be satisfied with 2 million more. You know, I mean, come back with something realistic. You know, if you need 50,000 for transportation, <coughs> 10 to, to hire a, an as needed grant writer, then that's a reasonable request. You know, we may have to do it for a while with free cash, but, you know, eventually, you know, un unfortunately, this is a, a, a terrible time in financing because we have tech and we have a possible new middle school and we're going to be looking at a DPW building and, you know, everybody's got their hand out. This is the perfect storm, but it seems like what you need, you know, is, is relatively small potatoes compared to all those other things. So. You know, my advice would ask. I mean, this is this happens to be the time to do it, and it may only be in the form of a free cash grant to get started. But that's not to say that it couldn't uh, it couldn't develop into more. Um, you know, I do I do believe in this stuff and the, the disparity between and the spending be, between the the shrinking segment of the population and the growing segment of the population has always bothered me. Um, so. You know, I, I think that we need to be willing to uh, make an investment. Well, that's great to hear. So when we come back in May, we'll, we'll, we'll think about how that could look and how Yarmouth can retain the leadership role for the 15 towns on the Cape and be part of this Massachusetts victory um, 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 as we compete against New York. I think you got to think about it before that yeah. because I think that our free cash yeah. will be burned up before then if you don't yeah. come through with a request. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So uh, the 50K is in the queue. That's already been asked for from free it's cash. we supplied to you. Yeah. Is it in the free cash? Grant? Yeah, so okay. th that was Dan's recommendation okay. probably uh, four months ago. Dan's been very supportive about attending these conceptual meetings through th that the age-friendly team has hosted to attack some of these problems and open up space about how we think about things and start to bring partners together. And he's been working very hard, along with Pat Armstrong, to figure out, well, how does that fit with all the mega load of everything else you do? How can we set the table to move forward and, and be the leaders and, and, um, and make progress for change that is needed to address the population's needs now while you guys are so heavily burdened with these other challenges. And uh, so we have walked a little lightly with the ask, um, but I will get that back to the team um, at next week's meeting. What is it that we could um, add to that list now? Small dollars to enable maybe the, the grant piece in particular. That would be helpful to the team. And have you talked to, I don't, Mary was here, but, you know, in, in terms of economic development, have you d have you tried to partner with the Chamber yeah. of Commerce? Yeah, so since we announced, we've had that conversation more than once, and I feel like uh, the failure in Yarmouth to really capitalize on that, you uh, you know, it's a tourist industry, and this flag, this flag should have been waved really high that Yarmouth was second in the Commonwealth to be direct members with the World Health Organization and looked to by Tufts Health Plan Foundation to launch the whole region. Uh, we've been the cornerstone of something really important. And so how you move that through your chamber and make that celebration, this model, promote that, um, you know, any thoughts or ideas about how to do that more effectively? I think people hear it. I think people have just been so bogged down in the changes that we've endured in management structure over the two years. And... Um, 
and and the pressures of so many big projects that this that's why I'm saying it needs to be in your in your goals that you want to be the leaders in in dementia and age friendly we can welcome more people in Mill Hill is ready to put money in 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 a kitty to do some kind of training with China Eric I mean the there's possibilities you just have to decide you want them uh, mr. chairman if I may this is actually a pretty good timing for this conversation. I'll be sending you an email probably tomorrow on a timeline for the request for proposal for um, the CEDC funding for the uh, tourism grant that we that we do. And I was going to ask for the board's input of what they'd like to see the town put into that document such that the respondent would be able to direct the marketing effort on behalf of the town in specific areas. Um, we've heard a lot, obviously, about some of the things that we've spent a lot of time on the past year, particularly with golf. But this is an area um, specifically I, I think we have an opportunity, to Kathy's point, to do more. I think the the piece that she had mentioned, which I'd like to get in front of the board, um, the December 19th presentation mm. that we went through was very exciting. And I think that would be f a fabulous opportunity, depending upon what happens with Mattakee School. But, but that particular site, we have a... You get the opportunity when that if that building comes to to back to the town's hand, have 70 acres to do a really transformative village that was proposed in the, on the 19th. It was unbelievable huh. what uh, the developers have put in front of us. And I think uh, for all, all the things that you heard tonight, that idea could definitely be a huge missing component, not just for our town but the entire Cape region. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, so and, we'll the, and the PACE program yeah. and, and the need for that financially. Uh, yeah, there, there are a lot of entities looking to us to put these things together and build the new future and what it looks like. So Yarmouth can be that. It's, uh, it's all in front of you. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to repeat a lot of the questions. Uh, I think a lot of comments have been made that okay. had a, uh, questions asked that already occurred to me. I, I do think, um, you know, not all of us have had experience with uh, caring for elders uh, and dealing with a lot of the issues day to day. So it's kind of like we don't know what we don't know. And I think the communication part of here's the kinds of services that, that are being offered or will be offered is really important to get that out to the community uh, so that people can start to visualize more about, you know, well, what does this really mean? And, and, you know, geez, maybe I, I should be thinking about taking uh, advantage of this. Mm -hmm. and, and because I really don't think people understand fully what might be offered and, and how it might be accomplished. And mm -hmm. they probably see the impediments. Uh, you know, you can talk about transportation. But, um, you know, I, I think our board is very supportive. But, I, you know, I, I think we look to certainly to um, – you, Kathy, to, mm -hmm. to find some of the things to us in in more detail, mm -hmm. uh, so that we can we can build those into uh, our our uh, goals for the year. You know, we'll be happy to do yeah. that. That's great. That's great yeah. to hear that. And I know Chris has a great tool in Visio yes. for us to do just that with. Yeah. Okay. Thanks again for coming. For a, uh, thank you. Thank program. you. Now, we'll move on to golf once again. <laughs> it seems like every every uh, second or third meeting, we've got something on the agenda with regard to golf. Always <laughs> goes back to golf. <laughs> back to golf, Always. right? Welcome, Scott. How are we doing? I'm doing well. So in your packet is the uh, proposed request for proposal that uh, the golf team has been working on related to the next steps in uh, what we had discussed when uh, J.J. Keegan was here as potential opportunity to review. So I'll let uh, Pat and Scott talk about that. Good evening. 
Um, in your packet was a brief 70 page um, <laughs> uh, now, synopsis of uh, the actual um, draft uh, request for proposal for um, management services for the um, Yarmouth Golf Division, including both courses and all the amenities as a part of it. Hearing your requests from the last uh, couple of meetings that we've had with you, um, I met with uh, Mr. Keegan and he has helped me put this draft together for you. This is, says third draft, but it was actually about the seventh iteration um, that we went through because blending the um, procurement laws of Massachusetts with Mr. Keegan's um, flowery wording, uh, the wonderful charts and um, knowledge of the industry and how to attract good vendors to come in and be interested in um, uh, bidding on this proposal, we, uh, we balanced very nicely with uh, Rich Bienvenu and his um, staff, Svetlana, they did a phenomenal job at giving us what we needed in terms of mass procurement laws and then uh, we put together with that our needs and what we thought was important. So uh, this document should cover your requests and get back to us if we're able to um, get it on the street. Um, probably, we're expecting probably seven or eight of the 14 vendors that have been identified as potential to come back with some type of a response. And the responses are in three categories. First, the full the, um, lease op option where a company would come in now with mass state law. I believe the um, restriction is three years or five years. It's three years, but you could go to a vote of town meeting and make it five to come in and run the course from soup to nuts uh, as they do in Falmouth at the uh, Falmouth Country Club. Uh, the second opportunity is for a management team to come in and negotiate with us um, handling specific parts of the operation, either to take over the staff or not take over the staff in that process, to run the, ca the restaurants, to run the post shop, to maintain the maintenance or not, they would tell us what parts of those they would want to have happen and what the costing would be and we could look at that and see if that soup to nuts. Dan wanted to make sure that there was some negotiation flexibility within that second option so that we could cater to what we felt our best needs were. Or thirdly, um, if you're interested, um, they could send a consultant. So a company could send a consultant for a year. Oh, I'm sorry, the management is again a three-year contract as demanded by state law, in procurement law. Or the third option would be um, a monthly charge for a consultant to spend between 20 and 80 hours a week, I mean a month, um, with Scott and his staff, giving them more um, in-house training, shall we say, on some of the areas where we find our weaknesses might lie, such as marketing, use of the technology and software to attract people to the courses. Um, we might be finding um, some additional support for Scott in ergonomics and um, agronomy and um, water use and leases with um, different uh, equipment companies or cart companies. So um, we feel that maybe because Yarmouth is a unique situation and Cape Cod is a very big golf attraction, someone else might know more than we know at the moment about how to run golf courses, so they might be able to come and use the people we have in our resources and help us. So that's what this RFP represents. And within it is uh, sprinkled all of the good investment we made in the work of Jim Keegan and his, his group on what golf looks like in Yarmouth, what our potentials are, what our, our shortfalls, our, our SWAT technology through it, and then um, the demographics and where, so that they understand these mosaics and competitive sets and um, all of the things provided by Jim are, are somewhat standard in the industry and the people that would be doing the, um, the bidding on this RFP. So we were a bit delayed because of the holidays and a few other things, and Jim had some other major commitments of, you know, just 14 golf courses on the Native American reservation in North Dakota or whatever. So when we finally got him to do this, it was pushed back. Our hope was that we could get it on the street and have someone available, if you choose to go in that direction, ready to um, come in in March. But that's just not going to happen now with, again, the bidding laws that are required. And as we push it into April, 
which is what we're looking at from the procurement calendar that was provided for you here um, on pages six and seven. It looks to be of someone maybe starting as early as um, April 15th, but probably not before. But putting this on the street, getting bids, putting together a selection committee representative of a number of different groups within the town, um, finance would have someone represented um, procurement would have someone represented. JJ, um, as part of his contract, would come and oversee that selection process. He wouldn't have a vote, but he would help direct it so that we got the right answers and the right pieces. A representative from the Golf Enterprise Committee. That committee would be based on uh, and recommended through um, Mr. Kanapik of who should sit on that committee to make that selection. I might not be on that committee. It might not be the appropriate selection, but maybe Scott is, as his experience as the acting director and his work in the industry. So whoever that is, um, they would rank the responses um, based on standards established in Massachusetts, um, and those standards would be, um, I'll have to find the right page, but Rich, if you can tell me quickly what those three terms are. Highly advantageous, Highly advantageous. Ad yes, and not advantageous. not advantageous. Thank you. That's what I was looking for, that right, that right term. Not advantageous. S not advantageous. And also along with that, you'll see within the, con the uh, RFP that the pricing doesn't go along with what they want to offer. So first we look at what their services is, what they offer, we rate what the value is, and then once those rankings have been established by the committee, then we open up the pricing and see who's coming in at what point. So it doesn't change what it is we're looking at because then we don't have to have this decision driven by price. It was ranked and established before the pricing was put forth before the committee. And then all of that information and the committee's recommendation will come back here before the board and we will make a presentation to you of what we feel we accomplished through this, what the findings were, and if you so desire, we'll give you our opinion. But we know that you don't have to ask it and we will not share it unless asked. I, I might say, Mr. Chairman, this is a very similar process that uh, we went through last spring with the water department. We were at a change <laughs> in leadership there and it was a similar scenario that was in front of us, a variety of different options, do a complete turnkey private enterprise event. We ended up settling on the idea of bringing in a general manager type, if you will, and already I can tell you that uh, that relationship with that firm has yielded us uh, a great benefit to the organization, and I think uh, as we go through that effort and get closer to the end of that term, Mr. Colby will report back to you that we have a really good roadmap as to how to proceed in the future such that when the time is right, we'll come back to the board to let you know what we are, we believe our opinion would be on that future for that department. So it's a pretty significant process. Um, this is maybe a little bit more complicated in that the document itself is uh, much more complicated. It's not as simple revenue scenario as water it was. This is complicated. We don't really know exactly what the industry will respond, but this is the start of the process. And may I also say that you know the golf department division as it's running presently and since they've come and spoken to you last and even since um, October has done exceptionally well and we're very pleased at where we're heading. Our, our revenues are up in the teens percentage wise over previous months in both 18, uh, I mean in both 17 and 16. We're showing a really strong revenue stream. We're showing still a reduction in our expense line so we're not overspending to get those revenues to happen. Scott has done an excellent job stepping in and I congratulate him here in front of you and the, to the community community because I, I'm very pleased for him. This was not an easy thing to say yes to. This was a mess. And this young man stepped up and said, I want to do this, and he has put his heart and soul into making that happen. And he understands the process and what's happening here. But I in no way want the fact that this was a part of what we agreed to as the process of how to oversee the management of golf to be a statement to the staff or to Scott and his group that we're displeased at all with the work they're presently doing. But this was a short-term fix till you had the opportunity and the resources to make a, a long-term decision on how you wanted to proceed. So I just wanted to be clear. I hope I'm not speaking out of turn and I think you all would agree with me. I, the courses have gotten great response. The membership is happy. The community seems very happy. I have not gotten, um, I can't count the number of concerns I've had brought to my attention on one hand uh, since the fall began. And we've really done a great job with that and Scott has. So thank you, Scott, for your hard work. At that, and it's a late hour, I'll stop and allow for questions if you so have them. 
Thank you. I, you know, I, uh, first of all, in terms of feedback that I've had as a golfer and, and you know, knowing what a few other golfers in the community, that the feedback has been very, very positive in the last six months. And, and, um, uh, and you know, I, I think if you ask people, they say, well, why are you going to change anything, you know, <laughs> because things are going well. But on the other hand, um, you know, we've, we've asked uh, the taxpayers in total to absorb a significant commitment uh, for this year, and I think we committed to, to um, presenting alternatives that the community could uh, uh, work with economically for the long term. So, so I think that commitment is something we need to follow through on. And, um, and, and that, that, doesn't, um, that doesn't reflect badly on what's going on now because I think everything that's going on now is very positive. So, uh, but if there are, are there questions on, at this point from the, from, uh, so I, uh, I the just board? have to say after, after reading this, I'm glad for your comments because that was my concern when I read this was the way that staff would um, take this. So I appreciate your comments. It's really not a reflection of anybody there doing any of the work. I think, I, you know, I hate to say too much in public because I don't want to, I don't want to skew, skew the process. I know how I lean already, mm -hmm. whether or not it's worth if there's support for all three of these options to even go out and look at all three of these options. Um, but I guess it's not going to hurt because we don't have to accept it. At the end of the day, right. I think we're going to um, be able to look at it. Some of them, honestly, I probably have zero interest in looking at. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a difficult thing to say in public. but. Um, I know there's a considerable amount of work that went into writing a document um, like this. Hopefully, um, we'll get some options and be able to make a, um, a decision. But I, I know I've been very hard on the golf um, division based on the town people financially having to support that. Um, but I have to say, too, I think that some of the decisions that have been made in the Golf Enterprise Committee, taking hard work and a look and working with um, the public and the members over the last many months, I think, uh, <coughs> will yield great benefits just in itself, just the way that the direction that it's going now. So, um, but I guess it doesn't hurt to look either. So, if I may, Mr. Chairman, sure. um, the selectman makes an excellent point. Some of the things that uh, often go on even if you decide to not change course we learn an awful lot about what industry thinks mm -hmm. our value is whatever the topic might be and I would anticipate with the selection committee that we would put together that there'll be that kind of uh, interview process we will we will glean a lot of very useful information so if you know and I understand where you're coming from and I I would say that um, the Golf Enterprise Committee really took ownership on this one, took some hard votes to move it forward, and we're in a better position today than we were this time last year. But I also am interested to learn what the industry thinks of our enterprise because it can provide us some very insightful information to move forward on. And if it turns out we don't end up getting a respondent that we want to take, that doesn't necessarily mean it's a lost cause either. Other comments from the board? Mr. Chairman, um, I think this is an incredibly thorough uh, RFP, and a lot of good work has been done to put it together. Um, I think I've been the most, I I've been incredibly anxious to see us take the step and move forward with it, uh, and I'm completely supportive of moving forward and getting this RFP out in the streets as soon as we can. Other comments? Sure. Okay. Um, I, I'm anxious to see what comes back. Uh, uh, I was in Phoenix just recently, had the opportunity to play on a course there. Uh, interesting, my, my daughter's boyfriend, uh, he's a plumber, went to a, uh, uh, a home that happened to be uh, Phil Mickelson's agent. I bet it was a nice place. <laughs> it was. <laughs> and uh, uh, he, uh, my uh, 
daughter's boyfriend is, he could talk to anybody. Right? He's, uh, <laughs> he's an interesting guy. But he um, uh, talked at length uh, with um, Phil's agent, and the guy says, well, I own six golf courses in, in Phoenix. And he said, if you'd like to play on one, I'd be happy to give you a, a chance to do that. And, uh, so Isn't that nice? We had, funny, we had a uh, day that was uh, a little bit rainy in the last six holes, so <laughs> we didn't enjoy it as much. But, you know, I thought uh, when uh, he came back and he said, well, uh, this, this person owns six golf courses, and I'm thinking, I'll tell you what, there's, there's money to be made in the business, and, and uh, you know, if we can get some, some hints as to what's going on out there that might be different from our frame of reference, uh, that would be great. Uh, you know, and I think that that's, uh, uh, so we have an opportunity. Somebody's making it. Somebody's making yeah. it, that's Somebody right. Somebody who's and, not charging uh, 800 bucks for a membership. <laughs> 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 well, I, I will say, uh, you know, that this particular place that I played, it was a beautiful course, uh, very well maintained, and, um, and I think that's a key. You start with a high quality product and that uh, uh, is, uh, is really important. And, you know, I think it's difficult. I think you need to have uh, uh, some, some high quality other facilities along with it in order to work on the edges of, of opportunity. Um, and uh, I don't know whether we're ever gonna be able to do that sort of thing with our clubhouses, but, um, those are areas where I think a lot of the, the uh, courses that are doing really well get incremental income. That, uh, uh, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, that uh, are very supportive, so. Mm -hmm. One of the concerns I'd have, uh, Mr. Chairman, mm -hmm. with any outside involvement in terms of the management of the courses, no matter how it's structured, is the maintenance of, of the golf courses. If uh, a management company is gonna take over all the maintenance operations and everything like that. Um, I'd want to know what safeguards would be in place uh, if they didn't live up to that responsibility because that going forward can make or break the golf courses and undo I'd certainly a lot of the- I'd certainly inspect some of their golf courses. Well, <laughs> that, then I'd be probably- <laughs> You might not want to depending on who it is. But that's Mr. Keegan's um, part of the contract with him that as he goes through the process of this um, RFP and then um, helping and chairing the selection committee without a vote. So he's not uh, skewing or, or anything. He won't be putting in a recommendation for any group. He then will help us contract and write that contract with the proper specifications to protect our assets. So that, because historically that's what's happened. The companies come in and they've, sure. they've you know, we, squeezed everything out of it yeah. that they could and left us with, you know, poor capital and poor equipment. And so he, you know, he's quite aware of that and hopefully we'll create a document if we decide to go in any of those directions that will protect our assets in the town, for the town for the future. Did I say that correctly? Yes, assets for the future. So we don't want to see anything else, you know, go to disrepair. We want to get the bridge fixed at Pass River. We don't want any other things happening. All right, do we need to actually take a vote on this to, uh, to issue the well, RFP? I think that you or do, but it would be um, nice, I suppose, that if you wanted to make a motion to support the generation of the advertisement, that would be great. Okay. So moved. Second. Okay. Any further discussion, questions? All right, those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Thank you for your support. For okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was a big lift by a small department, so I uh, appreciate that. Thank you. Okay. All right. Uh, next item on our agenda is land disposition policy. This yeah, has been a might, while in coming. And, yes, uh, it has yeah. been. Yeah, and uh, in preparation for this meeting, uh, Mr. Sentio was kind enough to review the tape from the September meeting to make sure that we incorporated what we believe to be all of the commentary. There was a fair amount and of board <laughs> commentary that went yeah. into that meeting. Yeah. And I believe we've capsulated oh. that. <laughs> okay. And provided some creative language to give you an out if you wanted to, so. Okay. Yeah, I don't, I don't have this document. Well, there'll probably be a handout then. They, but they were working on it as late as today. Mrs. Green was here just a minute ago. I know. Yeah. You have to. You don't have to. 
Yeah, yeah, the land disposition, right, it's, it is. Um, it, yeah. looks, it looks like it just runs on with the uh, golf. Golf, correct. With yeah. the golf Yeah, RV. it's at the tail end, right. Oh, up. here we go, yeah, thanks. Yeah, yeah. it looks similar. Well, it's such a large RFP. Is Karen gonna make a presentation yeah. on this? Yeah. Oh, okay, yeah. all right. Um, oh, here we go. Well, we, we can, uh, oh, there she is, ta-da, okay. Must have, must have been watching our TV. <laughs> Secrets out. Secrets out. Actually, we were, um, we did meet with town council today Good. to go over the policy and enhance some edits and so deadline copies for you. Nice. Sounds good to me. Okay. The one in our packet is <laughs> push stuff. I guess we just disregard yeah. the one in our packet. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you. Yeah, it is a red. Thank you. Red line. Hello, everyone. My name is Ed Sentio. I'm the uh, finance director. How are you all? Nice to meet you. Trying to make this brief. Nice to meet you. <laughs> Long time no see. Ed Centeo. Just don't spell it. Don't spell it. Yeah. Uh, what we did since our uh, previous meeting was uh, we went through uh, the video that uh, of the session, went through and gathered all the points that everybody made. Okay. He refers to it as the session. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> and incorporated uh, the information into the revised document. We've met with uh, town council a couple of times and just gotten his feedback as to uh, what should be uh, in the land disposition policy. So what we wanted to do is just uh, turn it over to uh, you all and uh, uh, let us know what you think and uh, are there any final edits before we sign off on it or are we good to go presentation no oh, you're on. okay it is it is organized we did we listened to the tape we watched the video took your comments we did try to finesse some of the organization here so the way it's set up uh hearing uh, and if you recall back to the town meeting really the the purpose behind this was there was uh, a proposal to uh, put up some land for approval at town meeting mm -hmm. and town meeting came back and said well there's really no process here so right. we'd like a process um, so what we've tried to do is give you a policy that says um, we recognize there is uh, a lot of land in town that sometimes people come to the town to look um, to buy a parcel of land, sometime the town recognizes the fact that we might have uh, more than we can take care of, you okay? <laughs> um, or, or there might be opportunities to work collaboratively with private property <coughs> owners. Um, we've categorized uh, the types of land disposition into just those, the ones where we get asked to buy or the town suggests something. There's also the scenarios where there's tax foreclosed property or land <coughs> of low value. Um, the internal process uh, also involves establishing two groups. One is a staff group to really put together uh, the nitty-gritty information on a parcel that comes up. What What's the story with the parcel? Who uses it? How is it used? Does it cost us money? Um, how might it be used? This information gets compiled and put to a land disposition <coughs> committee. Um, we've made the committee, um, you know, we could go one of two ways. I, I heard a comment earlier today that the, you know, the committee could be people who aren't necessarily involved. Um, I think that we've gone in the other direction and made it more representative of some of the board's uh, committees that have vested interests. Um, we have members from uh, the planning board, the open space committee, the recreation commission, the conservation commission, the Affordable Housing Trust, and the Finance Committee. So that's six. We added one at large to make it seven. Um, in the redlined copy that you have, you'll note that we struck per uh, council's suggestion. So this is different than what was in your original packet, um, the definition of a quorum. This will provide more flexibility if there's ever um, somebody's missing an appointment or, or whatnot, it enables the committee to run a little bit more efficiently. 
Um, the procedures are kind of stepped out. I don't, if you, if you like, we can go right through them, but they largely follow intake through the town administrator's office. If you flip to the uh, end of your packet, there is a form uh, that would be the request for real property. And this is the piece of uh, information that would be submitted along with any request, any supporting information, and it provides kind of rudimentary uh, informations around the ask or the suggestion as it may be uh, where a uh, parcel might come up or a group of parcels from uh, the town itself. The second page is a real property evaluation, real property evaluation form. Um, and this is an outline of information that would likely be attached. Um, there may be more, there may be less if it's not uh, available. This is the information that along with discussion at the staff level would go with the recommendation to the land disposition committee itself. The land disposition committee would then review everything and make a recommendation to the board of selectmen. Miss anything? Very good job as usual. Oh, well, thank okay. you. <coughs> Questions from the board? I, I, I start. Sure, go ahead. Um, I think you did a great job. <laughs> You're well, stop we, her. Don't, <laughs> we don't have time to waste here. Um, I, I think you did a really good job with the charge and um, the policy and procedure. I think on the application, one of the, some of the things that might be helpful is um, what we found historically in the past with any of these properties is deed restrictions, um, historical um, data as far as um, Board of Appeals decisions, things like that. I think that that's extremely important because a lot of them come with, you know, how it was conveyed to the town under what, pr you know, mm -hmm. under what process. So I think that that would be helpful. And you talked That's a good one. <clears throat> about consistency with town planning efforts and potential economic benefits, but I think greater benefits to the community might be good. They may not have an economic mm -hmm, impact, sure. but, but what the overall goal to achieve is, and maybe consistency with town planning efforts or board of selectmen goals. Okay. Thank you for your work on this. I think that sure. is going to help our process and the public having some confidence in what our overall plan is and seeing it in a process before it gets to town meeting. So I think it's gonna ultimately be helpful. Thank you. Do you anticipate having any properties uh, that will be presented to the May town meeting? No. No. I'd say maybe one. Okay. Maybe one. <coughs> we had an inquiry last okay. year. We weren't ready, and mm -hmm. maybe we are. Okay. Maybe we are. Okay. I think that what we need to do is with once you um, kind of what would be the next steps once the board approves, we need to put together the charge. That won't be hard. It's it's here, and then we need to establish a committee. Um, and I think the it would be just asking the representative boards for their nominee and then one at large member, and then we'd be good to go. Okay. I think to your point though, Mr. Chairman, it's fair to say because, at least since I've been in town, because we didn't have a procedure, and yeah. we learned from okay. that first town Same meeting dunk. about the uh, inability mm -hmm. to move forward on anything until we develop something, it's fair to say that there's probably parcels we could move and we feel like we could, and be a little bit more robust on that if we get this over the finish line. Yeah, I think, I think, I guess what I was thinking about is, you know, we had um, a lot of commentary at town meeting, and, and I don't know how we get word out that, okay, we've, we, we worked on it, and we've got all this stuff, and, and you know, is, is the first time that we make a presentation, are we going to talk about the process? How are we going to get across to people that, yeah, we paid attention at the last meeting, and, uh, you know, we've, We've worked on it. We've come up with a whole procedure. We have a committee that's working on it, and 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 so our presentation of any uh, potential 
um, disposals uh, is based upon having gone through that kind of process. So. I think you'll have some of that built in too because mm -hmm. the, the committee would meet uh, at a public meeting. I think people who were making comments at town meeting are aware of, of okay. this tonight. All right. Um, and then uh, it'll, it'll be coming to the board. Yeah. And so you'll have kind of that PR too. And ideally, if, if we do have a parcel um, or parcels for town meeting, then we'd have the committee there to kind of present. So the, the, um, the parcels that would be recommended for disposal will be advertised uh, in uh, our meeting plans so that uh, the, the public will be aware of what's being proposed in the yeah. in the selectmen's upcoming agendas is that what no, you mean? I'm talking or? about in, in the committee meetings uh, themselves is 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 there a plan for communication with the public uh, uh, well the committee advance? meeting is duly posted public meeting and, and that's okay. not to say right. through various methods social media and whatnot that we can't do uh, some outreach in that effort uh, you know we'd obviously talk to the newspapers and get some coverage that way and do some things to kind of you know set the stage for that we do have a process that's underway XYZ type of thing so okay. I, I think we'll be generally pretty successful by the time it gets to the board here if it has to go to the board then I mean there'll be a fair amount of uh, activity that took place to get it here and then certainly yeah. also generate its own well, I guess I'm, I'm not sure that I'd want to see it come to the board without having had some public process uh, uh, already. So in the, in the, on page two, um, for discretionary dispositions, um, let's see, item number four, um, the land disposition committee will meet at the duly posted meeting. So that's a regular public okay. meeting. That's fine. And then, um, they'll forward so item number six they forward the uh, recommendation to the town administrator's office for the board's consideration and so item number seven we actually do uh, a butter notification as well for when the uh, selectmen okay. will hear it. so 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 is that planned as a public hearing that yes. would With that would be a comment? public hearing correct bullet seven yes yep all right um we, we might want to say that as a public hearing then as opposed to just a public meeting oh, it, says, it says it in bullet number seven in, 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 in oh, bullet seven, seven? Yeah. top of oh, okay. uh, page three right. yeah. so okay. four item four is okay. the land disposition yeah. committee's meeting item seven is your meeting okay um, so so before it gets here there would not have been an, an opportunity for a public public comment there because four does not indicate public comment, it just indicates public meeting. A duly posted public meeting, not a hearing, but a meeting of a of a somebody we could take that could take commentary. It's yeah. up to the, yeah. that group to decide to take commentary, and that would be the forum to do that. And it's typical that uh, the public will be able to make comments at any of these meetings. There's okay. usually a segment for the public to make comments at any public meetings that we hold. Why couldn't you say in those meetings, of, um, those meetings, affording public commentary? Why couldn't you oh, just add that? We can add that. That's yeah. a and suggestion. Public would be more apt to yeah, but, feel they could participate if but, they had any issues. But there's, there's business meetings and there's workshop meetings, and workshop meetings typically, and they could have workshop meetings where they just go through the data, and then they, they could have business meetings where public commentary should be available, but not in every subcommittee meeting they take public comment. Well, I think at the meeting in which they're gonna take the vote to advance it to the Board of Selectmen, that would be the one to for sure announce your intentions. I you agree know? with that, yeah. but I'm not saying yeah. it. What, what Mike's saying is suggesting that they have to take public commentary in all their meetings. I didn't say that at all. I said to just put in there that meetings affording public commentary, and it's gonna be up to them as to which meetings afford the public commentary. Sure. Yeah, we'll make some language for that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, the whole idea was to make sure that this process was public. that's correct in public. Right. Yeah, absolutely and, and um yeah. and that every anybody that had issues or concerns could have a venue to to um express them sure yeah, yeah. okay 
Okay. Um, with those two notes, um, do you go, want to move this forward, or do you want us to bring this back to you with those minor changes? Make the motion. <laughs> yeah. Right ahead. The changes, I guess, at this point are. are We'll watch the session again. No. <laughs> That's it. Yeah. This one I can Just remember. This, segment. Yeah. this one I can remember. I'm, I'm not going to say anything. I, I think so the, it, you're going to come back to us with a, a, a quote unquote charge, right? That's right. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, that's an opportunity Are there to, two uh, or to, one? to do any wrap up of the, uh, the details. Tracy had a couple of them. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, yeah. So, Tracy had changes to the forms. And, and there's the add to item four of right. uh, inserting, affording public comment after the word meeting and before yeah. to review. Yeah. Right. Yep. So make a motion we approve them with those changes. Second. Okay, further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Good job. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you. Well Good done. Job. Thank you. Thank you. Record time. Sorry, we were late. <laughs> we only waited like 25 <laughs> minutes. At the coffee machine. <laughs> we delayed the meeting as long as we could. <laughs> you did good. Uh, great. Okay. Um, moving right along. Uh, committee appointments. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, just a few items here, are actually, okay. uh, real quick. Um, we have a resignation from uh, Rob Angel. Uh, he's stepping down from chairman or f from the uh, Water Resources Advisory Committee. So I would recommend that we accept his resignation with appreciation. And uh, was that a motion? Move, move to accept. Second. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor, say aye. Aye. It carries. Thank you. Uh, the next item. This is the last one. This is to um, make reappointments to the Cape Light Compact. Um, uh, I recommend that we reappoint Joyce Flynn as the town's town of Yarmouth's representative to the Cape Light Compact for a, a term that runs through the end of December 2019, and to reappoint uh, Dan Kanapik as the town of Yarmouth's alternate representative to the Cape Light Compact for an appointment one year term running through the end of December 2019. I move those appointments. Second. Second. Okay. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 It carries. And uh, that concludes my uh, my report. Thank okay. you, Chairman. Upcoming agenda. Uh, uh, we're getting into uh, budget season at this point. Uh, we have an executive session leading up. So we're going to have a 5 o'clock start. 5 o'clock start, um, yep. Uh, for next week. Right. Okay. There'll be also uh, two officers, our new officers, who started uh, in December. They'll be here for their official swearing in. Okay, and then uh, what is the schedule at this point with regard to major uh, department participation in the budget process? I believe that with the exception of on February 12th, uh, we had to change, we will substitute community services budget review with DPW on that date. And the DPW date was gonna be February 26th, that'll become community services, but each of the departments, the major departments are programmed in starting in on um, January 15th with IT budget. Okay and then going proceeding every meeting till we get it accomplished. Okay, so then uh, we've got the 29th with uh, both the police and fire. And fire, correct. Do you anticipate any discussion of dispatch? Yeah, I'll, um, I can give you an, an update on that now. Um, the, the goal is where we're at now on that is um, we've, we've identified an internal working team to come together on that and we should have to the board a recommendation, and it, it, it's uh, not overly ambitious, I don't think, but we should have something to you as to what to do on that topic by April. I feel pretty comfortable about that. Okay. All right. Uh, other comments or questions? Uh, on the um, roundup conversation. 
I do have. Um, I enjoyed watching that on TV. <laughs> I, 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 that uh, session. <laughs> uh, wasn't particularly interested in, in uh, personally participating. No, that. Uh, so interestingly no enough. Participation. That did spur quite a bit of conversation. What I can report to you is that Roundup and um, a derivative of another kind, we do have a little bit of it in use across the town. The, the most substantial use, if you want to call it that, that we've been able to identify would be for invasive species removal. So in the Phragmites case, apparently that plant is so hardy that uh, the kind, because we hire that work out, the, and all these people who apply this material have to be, have a state license to do that. They uh, cut the stalk of the plant and then they inject into the stock the chemical. So it's so I want I want you know I don't know you know we'll present like a department by department review of what we found, but in general it's very small doses. It's under very uh, significant uh, application procedure along with the directions. And then there's no aerial spraying. There's no wide scale broadcasting of it. It's very select. Whenever it is that it would be decided to be used. But what was the uh, interesting component of it? Nobody within our team has been able to identify what I would call as a cost-effective substitute to replace that with. Mm. So like, like anything else, if we were to remove it from the inventory, we could get by, but it would just mean like Phragmites would be manually destroyed as opposed to the way we would do it presently now, which is pre it's still pretty labor-intensive, but, but the, the chemical application gives it a little bit more durability. But the departments, of course, said whatever the board wanted to do, we would make sure we do. But I'll give you a report as to how much we use roughly. Okay. Yeah. Before uh, that meeting. Uh, okay. So, so we get some idea of what the budget impact is. When yeah. It'll be, it would be minimal right now because yeah. the idea would be we'd have to, like, I, I think I'm from town operations, real minimal because we don't use it hardly at all. But, uh, but for that Phragmites activity, that would, you'd have to get a contract or what that would look like. So that would be a little bit more. Um, the health department is going to weigh in on it on the 28th, on Monday. They did take some commentary. Uh, the health commission did last night. Um, they asked for some follow-up information from uh, conservation and I believe DNR, uh, and that will be presented to them on the 28th. So um, I'll have those findings of what, they, what the health commission came down with for your meeting on the 29th. I mean, those contracts that we've placed at various times, and I'm, I've forgotten whether it's CPA funds or... Free cash, like 15000 out of yeah. shot here or there, yeah. Fairly yeah. substantial, I yeah. mean, you know, and... The uh, problem is, though, it comes back and it comes right, back, so right. if you manually remove it, it's going to come back sooner, you know, that's all. Okay. So. Okay. Other questions? The only thing, um, I know the petition article closed, passed. Oh, yeah. Do we have anything on yeah, that? Yeah, we did. We had one on, um, I believe it's uh, plastic water bottles. Is that correct? Yeah, plastic water bottles. On uh, petition article? Yeah. Oh, really? I'll have a list, a uh, preliminary list for you. Hmm? Yeah, the banner. Yeah. Town property. I think, it's, I think it's, it applies to just municipal, the municipal municipal property. Municipal property, yeah. Not a town wide. Yeah, yeah. Thing, yeah. So, right. like the beach, right? So, we're going to bring glass bottles. I get the sense that this group may be going Cape Wide. I think yeah. they may be going no, I agree. to pick yeah. off every town. Yeah. Um, the only thing I, I was thinking and I'm, um, is adding a, or having a discussion possibly of adding an article, a sense of the meeting um, in terms of deregionalization. Just well, to see. Yeah. Um, what direction? We can put a placeholder on for a lot know. of I things. Mean, I don't yeah. know if it needs oh, no, to be a board discussion yeah, or if there anybody here is interested yeah. in it. But you know, we keep going back and forth about it, um, whether or not it's. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know if that's the direction that people want to go. And I think that if we have a sense of the meeting article uh, to give us some directive, that might be helpful. Or it, I think we should just have that discussion at some point. So January 29th, we'd make the decision at that meeting to close the warrant. So we just would have to have about a placeholder. Yeah. 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 So, you know, I, I, I think we've had the discussion. I think the, the, the question of how uh, do we want to spend some money on a more robust It's a complicated projection. situation. But that's that's why I think if we get a direction from town meeting, if they're not interested, I, I don't know if it's worthy of, of even looking at it. You know, we keep going back and forth about it and, you know, 
I can see I can see the benefit of you wanting the public meeting. The problem is I'm not so sure <laughs> that the people you get at town meeting are representative of uh, the entire population. Right. You know, you might get if they know there's a sense of the meeting, you might get all the school supporters there mm -hmm. to pack it up and say, no, no, that's not what we want. I mean, you might not get a true... To your point, though, impact. we could also do a non-binding referendum question at the municipal election, mm -hmm. which would get a broader yeah, audience. Yeah, probably give us more, um, more insight into the public feeling about it. As opposed to a town meeting vote? Mean? Yeah, I mean, because I mean, if your idea is you would you want a larger cross-reference of the population... I mean, we've already had some internal conversation as to what town idea. meeting could look like, you know, because we're going to have a, an article on there, for instance, uh, for the golf fee change yeah. concept, right? But if it's a beautiful Saturday, where are the golfers going to be? I don't think necessarily there'll be a town meeting, right? But but it's no. one of those things in this particular question because there is a broad of appeal for it. it you know, we're going to have a municipal election anyway, so there's no harm in putting a non-binding referendum mm -hmm. question. That would give you a pretty broad census as to what the, what's on the people's mind. No, I, I, Either I, way, I, I don't know that it it's it, I, I just. I'm thinking out loud because it's just, you know, asking people to express an opinion on that without mm, the dialogue. most important the piece of information. You're absolutely the, correct. The financial That's correct. It's I mean, easy I, to say, yeah, let's yeah, deregionalize right. or it doesn't cost what, us anything. What's the point? Yeah, I mean, uh, well, the, you know, the uh, point is, it's it's an expensive thing that we've been through before. And I think mm -hmm. undertaking that without knowing what the sense of what the community wants us to do is uh, the, the only benefit I, the benefit to town meeting is there's dialogue, you know, where people can, and no the, the school that. community can have their say as well as the benefits and whatever. But um, at some point in time, it's, we've got to make some decision or move on. Mm -hmm. So. Mm -hmm. All we need, like I said, is just a placeholder. We can always decide to pull the language, yeah. you know, so mm -hmm. we can do that. Well, I think, uh, you know, I think we have to have some discussion on how much will 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 it cost us to get a, a thoughtful presentation of yeah. the financial impact. I'll get that impact. number for you. Yeah. The numbers have been done before. Um, they're not probably too far off from how many years ago did we do that, Rich? Probably like three, four? Was it longer than that? Six. Six. Time flies when you're having fun. No, I think things have changed in the meantime, though. Yeah, especially. Our Perhaps. participation in the agreement uh, in terms of but I think how the much we're paying. It's going north. Uh, I'm not sure yeah. how much has changed, but maybe a little refresher. But I don't think we should expend town staff's time again to do it if that's not what the people of our town mm. want us to do. I, I, you know, I, I understand what you're saying, but I, you know, frankly, trying to recommend uh, uh, a referendum vote without having a presentation of the financial uh, benefits or losses, I think, is just asking for trouble. Why couldn't we do some public uh, presentations like we did? For the last I think one. we'd have to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll and then that would. I mean, I. I think we need to know what our, what kind of uh, money we'd have to spend for. Sure. For uh, yeah, and uh, you know, it could be a range. I mean, it, you know, we we may not uh, uh, have to spend an awful lot to get, you know, some some real basic information. You know, so. All right. Well, I'll get some direction for you for the next meeting. That's yeah. fine. Yeah. Okay. But in the meantime, I guess a, you know, at least a, pay, a placeholder so yeah. that we know that uh, uh, you know, we have the ability to put it on if we want to. I think it would be helpful to Dan for the next meeting to know when the deadline is for getting something on the ballot. Oh, the ballot is. Uh, we got plenty of time okay, for the ballot. Good. Yeah. But it might be helpful ballot. just to have yeah. that date yeah. memorialized. Okay. I might even be on the agenda. Mm. Yeah. We've been, we've had this question come up in the past. Um, well, we sign it March 26. So that would we be vote to sign the election warrant. So yeah, it's like 35 plus days ahead of time. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Anything else on the agenda? Okay. Individual items. Mark. 
I don't have any, Mr. Chairman, tonight. Okay. Mike? I'd just like to wish everyone a happy new year and to the members of this board. Um, I hope that everybody has a very healthy year. Great. Thank you. <coughs> Eric? Uh, I don't have anything. Thank you. Okay. All set. All set. I guess I'd just make uh, one comment. Uh, I, um, you know, we've in the past had some discussions about um, our overtime budget and where that stands, particularly with regard to fire and police. I think um, <clears throat> as we look forward to the fire department and, and police department discussions, um, you know, I, th I think we need to hear from them how their plans uh, or what their plans are to address that, that situation. I, I think we, uh, uh, it, it's kind of a, in the past it's been, well, we'll, we'll just continue with the same budget. And I, and I, I think we need them to understand what uh, their beliefs are with regard to the overtime budget. Call me tomorrow. <laughs> okay. No, that's a good point. Uh, Mr. Dwelly's working on an exercise for you for um, on that particular topic, though it is fair to say that I think the matrix report, particularly in the area of the police overtime scenario, had detailed quite specifically for us the significant driver with that situation is two different split shifts. That's why we work so hard to try to get everybody on four and two. Mm -hmm. But if everybody was on four and two, you get you pick up 16, to, for the same pay, 16 extra shifts every year. And yeah. then the other issue is because everybody's working the same, you don't run into problems. If somebody happens to be out, you don't necessarily need to call in because the overlapping of personnel is better under the four and two. And as you know, we, we just couldn't at this present time get there from here. The other issue is, and it's not just unique to Yarmouth, across the Commonwealth we're getting interesting uh, feedback. The LOD scenario is quite significant, particularly as a large mass of officers is aging, getting close to the retirement age. But the real big problem for all the departments is the uh, replenishment. And it's hard across the state. We're competing in a tough economy. Um, and it's so long to onboard a police officer that we spend an enormous amount of time paying this full-time wage. But what I would say is we've yielded some pretty good success. I believe YPD was interviewing 10 personnel already who have been trained, already employed with other agencies for vacancies that we have. We have four vacancies right now. We were just notified of another uh, uh, departure. It's not anything that YPD did. It was just the person wants to move closer to their home. So we continue to lose officers at a pretty good clip, but uh, by changing the hiring protocol for this one time, we were able to get a pretty good pool until the next uh, testing exam situation occurs. And we also, I believe, sent out offer lever letters to uh, four paramedics uh, for the SAFER grant. And then we had a fifth one come back to us who had left us a few months back to go to Hyannis, wanted to come back home. He lives here in town, so that was good. So, so we've had some success getting people who are trained on board quickly, but th those are big drivers for the overtime situation. But we're going to give you the comps and some other stuff uh, so that you'll have that before they come in front of you. Okay. Well, you know, I, I think I'm, uh, I, I'm interested in where our departments stand relative to other departments in Cape Cod and uh, in the Commonwealth for communities our size. Um, you that know, $250,000 grant, too, is going to help the pipeline and reduce that. Well, for the LOD, money. you know, I, I think with the, so. It's another piece. Just, yeah, on, it, on its face, we've level funded over time, and particularly in the police area for, it's been three years now that I've been here. But uh, before that, probably, and it, so it's never really adjusted for wage. So this latest scenario is for those long-term LOD cases we would be able to move that if this is successful through town meeting to an article and that would relieve some pressure. So we're trying to not have any growth in the overtime account. Mm -hmm. And clearly I think we're at the point now where they're down 12 officers. And if you have a, like a, we've had some years in the past where LOD losses were very low 
So the overtime draw is, is consequently pretty low. So it's a, it's a tough battle, but, but you know, fair to say, though, that the Chiefs will tell you that they haven't had any movement in that line item, and we're trying diligently to do everything in our power so that we don't have to move that line item. Mm -hmm. So. I don't know if that answers the question. I, I, I'm still interested in where yeah. our departments stand. So with police, though, big picture right. relative to other communities. Well, one of the things, sides. as you recall, the 80 percent of police agencies are on four and two schedule. You will you will not find any police agency that does what we do. So right out of the right out of the gate, the comp is going to be somewhat skewed if we're going up against the four and two community. It's going to be a, a challenge right out of the bat, but you will not find another agency that probably has this, the split schedule that we have that causes part of our problem. Well, it, to that point, Dan, that identifies what is the cost to our community. Yeah. What is you know what is it? Well, now, you know is, is it half a million dollars and that uh, you know we're incurring? I, I just it's, I think we need to get our arms around yeah. a number so that this board understands what what uh, the impact is I don't, i'm not yeah, sure that we the, know what the numbers are what's the present number we're carrying chris so we know the number for i can't think of it off the top of my head but i have the number for what the difference in the shifts oh cost, for the shift the cost yeah yeah right. we can, which we can certainly provide yeah. you yeah but in terms of this discussion we can check with uh the chiefs uh to see if they can have that information prepared for you as it relates to just general overtime and comps uh, in time for the 29th meeting. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. Um, consent agenda? There's um, a series of donations uh, on the agenda. There's also an application for the uh, Irish Festival to be held at the drive in site. We put that on the consent. It doesn't vary uh, significantly from last year. I believe it's a one day event, so it's one day less than it was last year. Yeah, it was two last year that I don't think they had great success on the second day. Um, we didn't have uh, in the wrap up, Mr. McDonough has done a good job. We have had. Uh, no issues uh, generally from the staff's perspective on his he had the summertime event too. remember recall uh, and he's coming back with that by the way I think he's going to do two of those maybe this summer but uh, but this was it didn't seem to be uh, uh, anything of significance that was beyond last year's scope so okay all right we have a motion on the consent agenda so moved. second <coughs> favor please say aye aye, aye. aye. opposed okay Great, thank you. Town administrator updates. Yeah, just a couple things I think that uh, are important for you. Um, the DHY legislation that we had special act on, uh, that got stalled in House committee, so it never got to the floor uh, to be passed. So that'll have to be refiled. That refiling um, at a later date this month, uh, I'm not sure what the legislative calendar would look like as to when that might get a hearing. Apparently the document was a little bit more complicated than the members wanted to delve into in an informal session. So that being said, we were trying to line up a scenario where we could vote on the regional agreement between the three communities for spring town meeting, but if the DHY legislation never actually gets enacted by Boston, um, there's probably not really, you don't want to put the cart in front of the horse type of idea. So I'll keep you posted on that um, as far as when we might think that might get a hearing, but a lot of times these home rules filed in January don't don't get over the finish line in the first year until December. So um, I'll try to do a little bit more reconnaissance with Rep. Whalen to find out when we might see that. The second part about that is um, Harwich and Dennis, much like Yarmouth, the negotiating teams have all looked at the agreement language that we had presented, and apparently we're generally all in a concurrence except for in one particular section, which is the number of commissioners. One of the towns was insistent that the, 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 the commission count is two, two, and two, as opposed to Yarmouth three, Dennis two, Harwich two. Um, so I suppose and the good news is every other detail in there was uh, generally agreed upon. So on the 14th of um, January, we have another uh, Tritown meeting group. From that group, we'll probably propose a date to you as to when the three boards <coughs> will come together again, probably sometime in late uh, January, early February. It would be my guess on the time frame on that. So it would be one of those, I, we, I believe we, we meet on those on a Wednesday night 
it'd be finance committee, board of selectmen, and uh, the advisory groups. What's the provision if there's a split vote having equal members? Well, so that's a really good question, right? So we had a variety of different discussions at our last meeting. One of them would be a, you could appoint an at-large member, like say the executive director of the entity that would only vote if there was a tie. I mean, part of the issue on this is the reality is from experience and with the other group that we looked at, they've only had a couple issues. The vast majority of votes are unanimous on these topics. Once the plant get, gets up and running, the formula is what the formula is for cost sharing. So there hasn't really been much of a debate. We but were supposed to get three. And each that's correct. And how would each oh, get two? Yeah. Because we had 50% of capacity. Right. Well, let's, let's so let's let Dennis pay the 50% and we'll give him the second vote. Just so we know who we're up against, I think it's fair that we know. Was it Dennis that suggested? Yes. That? Yeah. So that's um, what we're up against let, right let, off let, the bat. Let, let me just uh, jump in here for a second. Um, I spoke to Paul McCormick yesterday. Okay. And um, uh, asked him for some details about that discussion, uh, how that came up, what was uh, the background for the request for the two, two, and two. Um, he indicated there were concerns by expressed by one individual who has prior history from the Dennis Finance Committee. Um, and the concerns were that uh, if Yarmouth had three people, we might choose to pack that with three select board members. And, um, you know, I, I guess my response to that is, well, uh, why don't we just make a provision that you know, no more than one person on the committee can, from any of the towns could be a select board member. I mean, that, that's one one way to simply resolve it. I'm not saying that should be the solution, but that's one way to resolve it without having to change the distribution of the shares. Another way is to give each person two votes, make it a 14 instead of a uh, seven vote, There's, and th that way you, you, you spread out the uh, distribution. <laughs> it's uh, it's all frankly, equal. <laughs> frankly, um, we're we're over fifty percent, so we deserve three and a half people, four people on the board, right. not two. Round it up to five. Right, absolutely, <laughs> you know, and I and I you know I did ask. Um, Paul, if he thought we should reopen the the question of capital contribution uh, for the uh, sewage treatment plant, because you know if two two and two deserves a equal distribution of the capital contribution. Thirty three point three. That's everybody. right. Um, I mean, the, the premise so, that we would want to pack the the uh, commission with selectmen is ludicrous. I mean, does anybody here really have the time for that or the <laughs> desire right. to do that? The desire, right. You'd probably be looking for somebody with more finance and technical background to right. yep. to fill those those positions. I, I, I would assume maybe in an emergency situation, a selectman temporarily, so, you know, could, could fill the vacancy. But are they kidding? I mean, does he have any idea what we do? This is almost laughable, I don't though, honestly. For a second that that's We're not the even truth. off the ground. Right. Right? I know. I know. Exactly. Why who, did they have a meeting with their subcommittee for their finance no, committee? No, it was their subcommittee. It was their subcommittee. Yeah, each town is, 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 um, can, they're free to have their own way of appointing or electing or however they want to get their representation on the commission. So, Dennis can do what they want to do. I mean, like, Harwich can do what they want to do, and Yarmouth can do it, but they want to tell Yarmouth now how, how they should organize, which... Well, the, the other thing that, that a 2-2-2 two, two and two would, would allow... If it wasn't uh, true... When uh, is deadlock. for uh, Dennis and Harwich sure. to get together and override what Yarmouth wanted, sure. even though Yarmouth has a 50%, more than 50%, interest in the it's in the, the financial affairs all over again yeah, yeah. so you know i you know we're gonna we're gonna have a meeting of our own uh, subcommittee but yeah. i but i think you mean you you could always you know even though i think it's foolish you could you could always you know resolve it the way you said which is to limit 
a talent to one selectman. I'd be I'd be really surprised if you could draft a selectman to do it. But <laughs> oh, I'd do it. <laughs> we're already sewer commissioners. Yeah. Well, that's why we set it up the way it was that we're already. But they want to require a finance committee member. To of course sit they do. Of course they do. Yeah, they do. Yeah. They want to require a finance committee in the town of Dennis to send them. It's crazy. <laughs> Yeah. Let's not talk about this anymore. This isn't going to go. Well, away. you know, on that note, that's all I got for well, you. Oh, no, I moved, you know, to, I moved to adjourn. <laughs> <laughs> I know it. You know, I, I, you know, Dave Young advised we need to keep our eye on the ball. Yeah. You know, on, on what the objective is. The objective is to save a, uh, millions of dollars here uh, and, and not get too upset with the back and forth. Uh, but I think we need to. Uh, I can sense the, the direction of our board on this. Uh, you know, we're, we're not receptive to, to doing this 2-2-2. Two, two, and two. Uh, it's not, it's not. Uh, You know, it sounds as if, okay, you know, we could, we, without any big issue, we could probably limit the, the, the number of select board members from any one town. I mean, if if I Dennis wants to take 50% of the capital costs and operational costs, I would agree that it goes 2 2, two. Yeah, I, I, I think that that's clearly, uh, you know, what... Well, we'll agree to it for now and have a provision that we'll re renegotiate in three years. Yeah. <laughs> three months with them. <laughs> and that the membership shall be adjusted by the amount of crap we produce. Notwithstanding. Oh, good. <laughs> or, or by school population. Why not school population? We'll use that. <laughs> All right. Uh, we'll. Um, uh, any more items? Uh, no. On your list. No, it's, uh, it's been pretty busy, but uh, <laughs> I think, like I said, that was one of those topics uh, we tried at our meeting to uh, assure Dennis that I could hardly probably come up with a volunteer to serve. <laughs> but uh, but I figured that'll be one for a floor debate when we all get yeah. together. No, so. I think we'll have to. You know, to get the right person, I think uh, Mark will have to do some searching. <laughs> <laughs> if he doesn't come uh, up with anybody, it might be him. That's it. That's right. Thanks, Mike. All right. Do we have a motion to adjourn? I think there's already one on the floor. There was. Is there? <laughs> yeah, we already have one. Yeah, uh, we a second. second. Those in yep. favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? All right. Thank you.